Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. I want to preface this by saying this is one of my favorite subjects by far. And I have been delving into this for a number of years. Uh, and in fact, it was the, the topic of my master's thesis at the University of Jordan. Uh, and I'm still very passionate about uh, continued research and especially teaching on this topic because of how foundational it is. Like many other people, for me, the evidence for truth matters. Uh, and like many other people who are not exposed to this topic frequently, especially non-Muslims who may not know any better or Muslims who have never really read much or heard much about uh, the topic of I'jaz al-Qur'an, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, uh, this is one of those topics that really serves as a foundation for everything else. So when someone asks, for example, why Islam? It is this subject that serves as one of the, the foundational responses to it. And so I want to start actually by sharing a, a story and some examples of experiences uh, of conversations. Uh, I enjoy one-on-one -on -one conversations more than anything else when it comes to talking about religion, when it comes to searching for uh, what people believe is true. And what I notice often, what I noticed over the last at least 10 years or so, so oftentimes when people are searching for uh, truth and truth here, again, they, they people understand in different ways, they're coming to truth with some assumptions already, with a methodology already. And what I mean by this is the following. Uh, in many of these one-on-one -on -one conversations, someone would say something along the lines of, I'll believe in God when, and then they'll give an example of a term, a proof, a sign, an evidence uh, on their terms that they will uh, then accept according to their claim as sufficient to believe in God, or I'll become Muslim if I were to see X, Y, and Z proof, evidence, which is understandable uh, at a very uh, surface level. Uh, but one of the, the you know, most uh, unreasonable things to do is to come to uh, the truth with limited terms, with limited uh, possibilities. And what I mean by this is the following. Uh, a convert to Islam, converted from uh, atheism, and later on he was uh, agnostic for a while, and then uh, a deist actually, and, and then alhamdulillah he became a Muslim. Uh, the conversation started off like many other conversations where he said, prove to me that God exists. And I know this may seem like a very weird preface to the subject that, that's at hand, but bear with me inshallah ta'ala, it is very relevant. Prove to me that God exists. A very common first sentence that I receive, whether through emails or messages online, in person, prove to me that God exists. Uh, what would convince you to believe in God? Under what terms? What sign would suffice for you to believe? And people respond in different ways, but oftentimes it's something that's very empirical, something that is uh, breaking the laws of nature in some way. So many people say, well, if God would reveal himself to me, or if God healed someone right in front of me, or if God did X, Y, and Z right in front of me, I'll then believe. And my uh, usual response, depending on what they say is, so you believe there's one possibility of a sign or an evidence for the reality of God, and you would believe in God based on that? Yes or no? Yes, logically. Uh, it's, it's very straightforward. Do you believe there are other possibilities than the one you listed? Is it logically possible that there are other signs of God that you might be ignoring? Is it possible or is it impossible? So, well, it is possible, of course. How many possibilities are there? And usually when I ask this question, the person has gone from uh, claiming one uh, evidence, one possibility of belief in God, to then having to admit there are countless possibilities, countless signs, countless miracles, countless evidences of the reality of God. And in one of these conversations, and the one that I referenced, alhamdulillah, long story short, I asked him, if one of these signs, if one of these miracles is a revelation from God, what do you imagine it would contain so that you know it's not man-made, so that you know it is from God? He would say it has to be perfect, has to have information no human being can know. Uh, we have to know that it, that it's not been changed by people, so it has to be preserved. And as he's listing these, I'm smiling. He's like, why are you smiling? I'm like, can I introduce you to the Quran? He's like, I already know about the Quran. So what do you know about the Quran? I said, well, some of the things you listed, we already have. We already know these things. Do you think two billion Muslims just want to follow blind faith? Do you not think we have a very clear evidence that the final revelation is the one that we are following? The Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Long story short, alhamdulillah, he became Muslim. But this is one of many conversations that I've had with people who sincerely, as far as I can see in terms of the action, are looking for truth and will follow the evidence. Now, there are many other people who will say, I will believe in Islam or I will become Muslim or I will believe in God 
and they'll give you a claim, but they're not sincere about the claim and we can't see in people's hearts. So we do our part and we move on. So this question, why Islam is answered through two primary things, two primary topics amongst others. The first, which I will not be covering today, is the proofs of prophethood, dala'il nubuwa. And the proofs of prophethood, we believe every prophet that was chosen by God came with a proof, because otherwise anyone can claim to be a prophet, which has been the case in history. Uh, there have been imposters and liars. So a prophet comes with proofs, and people ask, uh, what is an example of a proof? Musa, alayhi salam, Moses had many signs and many proofs that people could not deny unless there was some arrogance and pride. So the splitting of the sea is just one example. Uh, you have examples of prophets that come with different types of proofs that are limited in time and space. Long story short, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa had many proofs and the Quran serves as one of these proofs. And it is a timeless proof. It is a timeless evidence uh, in terms of the, the subject of ifbat nubuwa or dala nubuwa. And uh, this is one that I will not be covering. You can find a lot about it in other places. I will be covering the second topic, which is foundational. And that is the miraculous nature of the Quran. This is a topic every Muslim needs to know about. And in fact, I will, I will say this, every person who claims to be searching for truth should want to know about this. Why? Because oftentimes when people are searching for truth, they'll claim, well, there are too many religions to, to search through. I've spoken to an atheist before, said there's too many possibilities out there, thousands of religions. I said, well, first of all, do you think God is unjust that you would have uh, no clear evidence in terms of the truth? Second of all, are you really claiming they are all equally valid in terms of the evidences that they provide or in terms of the opportunity to research? Look at, for example, the the, the uh, main religious uh, adherents or the main religions of the world in terms of the number of followers and see what is it that they have. It's not that many options. You look through them and you find very quickly a number of problems with the New Testament, Christian history, and other things that I will not be getting into here, but they have been covered in blogging theology. And then you get into Islam, which by 2050 or 2060, I believe according to one projection, maybe 2070, and Allah knows best, will be the largest uh, religious uh, group in the world. And it's not about the, the quantity here, but just a matter of fact that it's easy to find the resources you're looking for. So it doesn't hurt the one who claims to be searching for the truth to explore this subject, this topic of the miraculous nature of the Quran with an open mind and open heart. If you're looking for the truth, you will find it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator guarantees that those who put in effort uh, towards guidance, towards the truth, will be guided and they will be given God consciousness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. What is a miracle? What is a miracle? Now, in uh, if you look at the, the different companion books and philosophy and, and uh, th philosophical theology, when it comes to the subject of miracles, it means many different things. And this is why I actually want to define it very uh, cautiously here. In English, the word miracle means many things. Uh, and even in Western philosophy, there are a number of different approaches uh, to introductory text about the, the definition of a miracle. I'm not talking here about just the breaking of a natural law, or the laws of physics. Uh, a miracle is in Islamic theology, uh, a mu'jiza specifically is the breaking of customs. And it's not just the laws of nature. It includes the Quran, things that people cannot imitate. And it is from God's command. It is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, we would not call it a mu'jiza. And I will be using this term uh, more frequently in, in this presentation, just so we are uh, clear about what a miracle is, because sometimes it's understood in different ways. One of the scholars uh, proposed that there are shara'at conditions for a mu'jiz, and there are many different approaches. This is according to uh, Al-Qadi Abdul Jabbar in Al-Mughni. And he says a, an act requires the fulfillment of four conditions in order to be considered a miracle. And some of these can be combined in one. Some of these are subjective in their approaches. But these are just to kind of uh, introduce uh, listeners, inshallah ta'ala, to what a miracle is or a marjiza. The first is that the miracle must be coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly or indirectly. Now, what that means directly or indirectly is that, uh, for example, the splitting of the sea, we cannot see uh, how exactly this took place in terms of the command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you might use the word directly here. And other things like, uh, for example, some of the miracles that came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in terms of uh, angels that then carried out these orders. We don't really know the details behind the scenes, but this is why we cover all bases by saying directly or indirectly. Revelation comes through Jibreel, Gabriel, alayhi salam. So this is an example of uh, something that is from God at the end of the day, but it could be through uh, an angel uh, rather than just a direct command of uh, a punishment that, that comes down to a previous nation or, or anything like that. The second condition is that the miracle uh, must break the uh, the habit, the the ada of the people. Basically, what this means is that 
It's uh, doing something that people themselves cannot do and will not be able to do. So the second and third condition are very similar here. And if you want, you can combine them. It breaks the habits, the practices, the abilities of people. It's something that has not been done or cannot be done. An example of this is the splitting of the sea or the uh, miracle that was given to Jesus, Prophet Isa alayhi salam, with the uh, clay bird uh, to be given uh, life. Uh, this is mentioned in the Quran, and this uh, affirms, in fact, what was mentioned in the uh, rejected uh, gospel of, of St. Thomas. And so this is just a, an example of a miracle that people themselves cannot do. And it is uh, one of many proofs that it's not coming from a human being. Um, Al-Qadi Abdul Jabbar actually adds this third condition, this third shart. So he says people must be unable to perform it. This is where ajiz, incapacity, or incapability comes in with respect to its uh, kind, its jins or its uh, slifa, its quality. So it's going to be something people cannot imitate themselves because they are limited in their capacities. And the fourth, a miracle must be specifically linked to the one who claims prophethood. Here's where there is a distinction uh, in Arabic or sorry, Islamic uh, theology and uh, using the word English in Western philosophy, where in Arabic, when we use mu'ajiza, we're referring to something given to a prophet. When we use other terms, we may be referring to, so let's say uh, somebody asks about the uh, ad-dajjal, the end of times, sometimes used in English, the, the term is uh, the Antichrist. Uh, those kinds of abilities given to a dajjal or a miracle given to a righteous person who is not a prophet, that's not falling under the discussion of a mu'ajiza here. So what is the point of all of this? The Quran, in Islamic theology, the Quran is a proof of prophethood. It is a miracle. It is a verification that the individual claiming what he's claiming is truly blessed by God with prophethood, with the mission and the responsibility of uh, delivering a specific uh, message to the people. And in this case, we are talking about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace be upon him, with the final message, the final uh, uh, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to all of mankind until the end of times. So what is the Qur'an as a mu'ajiza? The, the subject here is i'jaz al-Qur'an, and this is the term that's usually used. We believe as Muslims that the Qur'an has characteristics that are of a miraculous nature, meaning it is beyond the capability of human beings because it is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, kalamullah, and mankind's inability, ajiz, to imitate the Qur'an is a proof of its divine origin. Therefore, we believe it is an ongoing mu'jiza. The word in English we're using loosely is miracle. And it breaks the ability, the natural order. Until the day of resurrection, people are unable to imitate it or come up with anything like it. And it is a clear proof of prophethood. Now, when we apply this word, i'jaz, to the Qur'an, we are referring to the uh, unique and inimitable quality of the Qur'an uh, that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the, the most superior of uh, speech. It is the it is uh, superior to all other books and all other things, and it cannot be rivaled. It is unparalleled. And the basis for all of this, the entirety of what is called I'jaz al-Qur'an, if you want to call it a doctrine, the entirety of this uh, doctrine of I'jaz al-Qur'an is actually from the Qur'an itself, where when the uh, opponents and the opposition to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when especially the elite, the wealthy, the rich, the, the people of political status would reject Islam because they had their own agendas and their own power to hold on to and their own uh, basically worldly ambitions and, and, and so on and so forth. They rejected the Quran and came up with many excuses. And when they came up with these excuses, when they would say it's fabricated or he's a magician or he's a liar or he's crazy, make up your mind, which of it, which of these excuses are you actually choosing? When they said it's fabricated or it's uh, from someone else or it's from something else or it's magic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them very clearly and gave them a challenge. Uh, if you have doubt about what we brought down, what Allah revealed to his slave, his servant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, here's the challenge. Then come, bring forth uh, a surah. In Arabic surah here, uh, sorry, in English it means uh, like a chapter of the Qur'an, number of ayat or verses. Bring forth a chapter like it. And you find many other challenges like this in the Qur'an. In fact, on six occasions there are references to different types of challenges. Produce something like it. If you don't believe it's from God, then bring something like it. If it's man-made, you can clearly and very easily imitate it. In fact, 
not only should you be able to imitate it if you think it's not from God, you are the most likely of people, the most proficient in uh, rhetoric, in Arabic poetry, to come up with something like it if you think it is not from God. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in fact, makes it very clear, and this is a promise of Allah that has been fulfilled and will continue to be fulfilled in the following verse of Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 24. فَإِلَّمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا And if you are unable to do so, to meet this challenge of God, to bring something like his speech, if you are unable to do so, and you will never be able to do so, you will never be able to do so. And when I mentioned this once to uh, an agnostic uh, colleague, he said to me very bluntly, he's like, well, this sounds like the type of challenge that cannot be won. Like there is no... Uh, there, there isn't a possibility of falsifying it. I said, you're thinking about this uh, from either a philosophical lens or a scientific lens. You know what the, the Quranic challenge is. You know what the Ijaz al-Quran is about. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking boldly and clearly and about the future as well. The people will not be able to meet the challenge. If you think you can meet the challenge, then study Ijaz al-Quran and see what's brought forth. The most likely of people could not meet it. As many academics, Muslims and non-Muslims have stated over the years, this challenge was never met. This challenge has never been met. Now, the verses here, uh, sometimes they are referred to as the uh, verses of the challenge, uh, ayat al-tahaddi, uh, it's a, a subjective term you can use to understand what we are referring to. Basically, there is a challenge to produce something like the Qur'an if you don't believe that it is from God, if you believe it is man-made. And according to the famous scholar of tafsir, uh, Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, he held the opinion that the initial challenge when they when they came up with this excuse and this rejection of the truth uh, is that there was a, a challenge to produce something similar to the entire Qur'an. When they could not, it was reduced. The next challenge was reduced to 10 surah, 10 chapters. If you could not, it was reduced then to one surah. And they still could not meet that challenge. And these were the most uh, proficient and most advanced in terms of Arabic uh, rhetoric. And I want us to consider just for a moment a, a small tangent here. People usually know with the stories of the, the prophets, the previous messengers, uh, examples of what might be called a miracle or a murajiza. So Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam, Abraham, was thrown into the pit of fire and it was made uh, cool and safe for him. While Jesus, Isa, alayhi salam, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, was able to heal the sick and revive the dead. Musa, alayhi salam, witnessed a number of different miracles and his people saw these miracles from the staff to the uh, the, the, the frogs to the example of the uh, splitting of the sea that is uh, famous uh, and of course, the, the staff that, that had consumed and defeated the Pharaoh sorcerers and they became Muslim, they submitted. It was a clear sign of God, clear sign of prophethood. When the truth comes to you, don't wait, don't reject, don't procrastinate, don't allow your pride or your ego to get in the way. Uh, and there were other prophets that were given, you know, different miracles. Uh, Solomon, Suleiman, I said, was given the power of controlling the winds for transportation, understanding the language of animals from a Quranic perspective. All of these are mu'jizat, and mu'jizat are also signs, signs of God. And they serve various purposes. You look through the Qur'an and you find every ayah is a sign. And this is why the word in English, verse or verses, is a kind of like a weak translation. Uh, the ayah in the Qur'an is an indicator of truth, an indicator of God's powers, an indicator of who you are as a human being. And they fulfill different purposes. Uh, one of the purposes of signs as uh, you heard earlier, is for people who are not upon the truth to then follow the truth, for people to be guided. But not everyone follows signs. You know, even in a worldly sense, some people drive and it's as though they're blind to all the signs that they see around them, right? They drive and it's like there are no signs at all. How many times do you want to warn somebody? Warning, 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 slow down, slow down, slow down, and then they crash. I wish I was warned before. I wish I paid attention before. Well, the signs were there and that's a very uh, insignificant worldly example. People do this all the time, unfortunately. But with regards to the signs of God, uh, th they're there for you to find the truth and then to find reinforcement. And that's why when you are Muslim and you do pray and you fulfill the command of God and you're uh, taking those warnings very seriously and the glad tidings as well, you pray every single day and you recite, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, guide us along the straight path, keep us guided, in other words. So you don't want to say, I want to see the truth and then accept it and then let go of it. Rather, I want to continue taking in all the signs of the Quran and the signs around us and within us so that we are not people of arrogance and that we are following the truth. Because at the end of the day, people are either following the evidences for truth or they are following their desires, whether the desires of 
uh, worldly things and worldly temptations or the desire to be pleasing to other human beings and to buckle under the pressure of societal pressures. May Allah protect us from uh, pride and arrogance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, and it's a very frightening verse in the Quran in Surah 7, Ayah 146. Uh, I will turn away from my signs those who act unjustly with arrogance in the land. And this is talking about the state of one's heart then then manifest into actions. Arrogance is the most destructive of traits and it, it blinds you from the truth. It is something that completely clouds a person's judgment. You can give someone 100 miracles that are both empirical, rational, and filthy based according to natural disposition, and they will reject every single proof that you've given them because they're not after the truth. They're not after some evidence or sign. They're, they're holding on to what they want to hold on to. And here's the frightening part. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if, if they were to see every sign, every miracle, every type of sign, they would still not believe in them. And if they see the right path, they will not take it. If they see a crooked path, they will follow it. This is because they denied the signs of Allah. They were heedless of them. May Allah protect us from any kind of pride or arrogance. And here's the promise. Once again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, we will show them our signs in the universe and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Here it, some of the scholars of tafsir say Islam or the truth, meaning the Quran specifically, the, the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suffice. The miracles are all around us. Do not limit yourself to your terms, to your claims, because you don't know that that is the uh, the, the the completeness or the, the exhaustive list of miracles that are out there. Rather, you recognize Allah can give you any type of sign. And one of the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for humanity and for the jinn as well is the Quran, is revelation. And here, a preserved message until the end of times. Now, these Meccans receive the Quran. And some of them started to request, like people of the 21st century, started to request visual signs, empirical signs. So, uh, and, and, and I want us, uh, I want us to consider here the, the context of the, the Meccans who are rejecting this. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying just to translate, uh, let him, they're saying, let him bring us a tangible sign like those prophets sent before. I'm adding in the, the tafsir with the commentary here. The reality is there have been people who requested empirical signs in the past and they rejected them. And I want you to imagine today we are at 8 billion human beings approximately. I want you to imagine there was a way to survey all 8, 8 billion human beings and to be asked the, the, the following question, if uh, such and such sign or miracle from God were to take place, uh, let's say today, would you believe in God or would you become Muslim? And I want you to imagine all 8 billion people agree that if this thing appeared out of thin air or this thing happened, that we would all believe in God. Imagine everyone makes the claim. That's all I want you to imagine. The claim was made. So the people of Salih, alayhi salam, Prophet Salih was sent to the people of Thamud. They requested a, a camel, a she camel, a naqal. They were given the, the, the miracle uh, on that term. They were given the miracle to see. You would think with the way people talk today, with the way that there is radical skepticism, uh, and very bold claims that people are looking for proofs that everyone became Muslim. No, some of the people rejected Prophet Salih alayhi salam. Not only that, some of them killed, plotted and killed and slaughtered the, the uh, camel. What does that tell you? Not everyone is after the truth. And this is a really uh, frightening uh, reminder for us to, as human beings, to look within ourselves and make sure we are sincere and that we are humble uh, when the truth comes to us, that we accept and we follow it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا مَنَعَنَا أَن نُرْسِلَ بِالْآيَاتِ إِلَّا أَن كَذَّبَ بِهَا الْأَوَّلُونَ Nothing keeps us from sending those demanded signs, except that they had already been denied by people before. And Allah references the people of Thamud. And so the reality is not everyone is after the truth. And I want us to keep this in mind because oftentimes when we talk about mu'jizat as signs, we're looking for something specific. And once the, the, ter once the, the miracle on our terms is there, then some people are like, okay, now we'll accept the truth. Let's look at this further uh, from one last angle and, and see that there are people today and people in the past who said that if they could see God or they could see certain things, they would still not believe, they would think they're hallucinating. Other people would say it's magic. Other people would say something's wrong with me or somebody set this up. Some people will never believe. Let's end it at that and just say, let's approach the topic of the miraculous nature of the Quran with complete sincerity that we are looking for what is true, so that when the evidence is there, we follow it, we're held accountable for everything we do, and that we pass the, the questioning, the trials of what we did with our lives and what we did with the signs that came to us. I want to talk very... 
Yeah, uh, so, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I mean, uh, we should also you know, uh, remember that Iman is greater than merely believing in the existence of God or merely believing that, um, uh, you, uh, you, I, I mean, who has been exposed to more signs than Iblis himself, right? I mean, Iblis has, uh, is exposed to the supernatural realm. He knows that Prophet Muhammad is the true prophet of God. He knows very well that Islam is true, but he's not spiritually receptive to that truth. He's not willing to submit to that truth. And so at the same time, you know, uh, mere evidence, acceptance of evidence may not be sufficient for spiritual transformation for many people because, okay, they may come to acknowledge that this is a true religion, but they may, may not be spiritually disposed or, re- or, or inclined towards submitting to that faith and submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I think this is something else that we also need to consider, that it's not just some intellectual block that is there, uh, as some of you know, pe- people who reject Islam try to portray that, you know, I am not intellectually persuaded by the evidence for your faith. I mean, there could also be spiritual obstacles there as well, whereas some people are too arrogant to, to submit to a higher power and to, you know, and, and so on. So I think that's also useful to, to remember and bear in mind. Jazakallah khair, absolutely, barakallah fikum. Uh, SubhanAllah, oftentimes people see this as a as a purely intellectual pursuit, and that's why uh, we started those examples of people who are given all types of signs and miracles and evidence that they don't accept. Uh, and for many people, it's uh, it's kind of the, the entry point, you know, the evidence is there, now you become Muslim, and then you have to build your iman, develop it, learn who Allah is, submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with humility, uh, develop, uh, sorry, purify your, your natural disposition, the fitrah that Allah gave you. Uh, this is more of a fitrah based or spiritual pursuit than uh, an intellectual one. Uh, but the proof here for for uh, those who don't know is uh, is that this is also an intellectually rigorous uh, religion that we are not just uh, blind followers looking for you know what you might see as just feelings. No, there is a spiritual element of of uh, you know faith and there's uh, iman, belief in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and there's of course the intellectual justification if someone is. Uh, in need of that, Allah Ta'ala. Barakallahu uh, A lot of times people ask, I know this is uh, history and a lot of people may not be interested in this. I'll try to make this very brief, inshallah Ta'ala. I um, kind of explore this further and, and in more detail in uh, one of the articles uh, online on Ijaz al-Quran. Uh, long story short, the history of Ijaz al-Quran as a doctrine, we already mentioned the concept itself is from the Quran. The concept is at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him. Uh, we are talking here about the uh, packaging, and, and this is how you see uh, other fields as well, like fiqh and usul and uh, you know tafsir, that there's a packaging in terms of how to teach it, how to approach it in a structured fashion. Uh, why did it develop further and uh, when and by whom? There are a number of different people who wrote about it. Uh, not many uh, texts are uh, have, have survived from the earliest of centuries, the first and second century, for example, but there are references. And one of them is Hujjaj al nubuwa by Al-Jahad. We don't necessarily take uh, everything he said. Uh, however, he, he was somebody who addressed it. Uh, and you find that uh, there was a lot of discussion on uh, I'jaz al-Qur'an under the under the, the uh, subject of proofs of prophethood. It was one of many uh, topics when talking to non-Muslims or people that, uh, that were being exposed to Islam for the first time, this was a subject that would arise. Two of the factors that seemed, and I, I say seemed because it's it's not always easy to know, but two factors that seem to contribute most to the development of Ijaz al-Quran. And the first is uh, the significant amount of commentary, tafsir, on ayat al-tahadi, the, the verses of the uh, challenges. And so there was commentary from uh, al-Tabari amongst others on the nature of the Qur'an, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. And there was one other as well uh, factor, which is one of the groups, uh, the heretical groups with deviant views about the nature of the Qur'an, the Mu'tazila, uh, would talk about the createdness of the Qur'an. And they turned this into an inquisition. Long story short, they went after uh, many uh, Muslim scholars, uh, uh, the, the most notable, of course, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, in terms of the inquisition, the mihna, and what he went through. And the point, I, the, the reason I mentioned this, the point here is that the ongoing conversations about the nature of the Qur'an amongst different groups uh, at that time that became prominent and then died out in terms of some of their influence and some of their influence lasted, 
Uh, and later you had the Ash'arite scholars, the Ash'ari scholars as well, uh, talking about the Ajaz al-Quran, uh, the most notable, maybe uh, amongst the ones I have here is Al-Baqillani, uh, talking about, you know, theological and philosophical issues, expedited some of the discussions that people were having, the scholars were having, the students of knowledge uh, were having. And so it saw some progress in uh, Ijaz al-Quran uh, doctrine uh, in the uh, 4th century, especially in the 3rd century as well. I, I gave some examples here of uh, detailed works uh, from the uh, scholars of the 4th century and the 5th century Hijri, Ar-Rumani, Al-Khattabi, Al-Baqillani are some of the most notable ones. And when I mention these names, I'm not necessarily endorsing all of their views, but rather these are the scholars who wrote about Ijaz al-Quran. You had later on uh, Jurjani, and of course, some of the notable names uh, that people know, like Ibn Taymi, Rahimullah, wrote about Ijaz al-Quran. Uh, you have, of course, uh, Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti, Rahimullah, wrote a lot about Ijaz al-Quran and many others as well. Uh, this is a little bit of the history, but again, there's the tafsir of certain verses. There is the uh, dispute about the nature of the Quran, and then there, and that's intra-Islamic. And then you have the da'wah, the the uh, conversations about Islam and religion when Islam started to spread across the world, and people were being exposed to Islam for the first time. So the proofs of prophethood uh, was at the forefront of also introducing Ajaz al-Quran. This is kind of a brief summary, but this is the history that some people are not really uh, interested in. So I will move on, inshallah ta'ala. The scope of Ijaz al-Quran. What are we talking about here? I know some people, they hear about this, like what makes it miraculous? Just get right to it. We're building these foundations, inshallah ta'ala, step by step, so bear with me. What makes the Quran miraculous? Now, the Quran is miraculous in multiple ways, meaning there is Ijaz, as you'll come to see, as I'll explain, inshallah ta'ala, from multiple angles. And this is the opinion of many scholars, including Ibn Taymiyyah and many others even before that, Al-Khattabi held this opinion, and it was beyond just the uh, let's say, literary or linguistic miracle of the Qur'an. Uh, some of the scholars used to focus on just one aspect of the ijaz of the Qur'an. And so uh, Al-Baqillani wrote a lot about the literary argument. And there's there are so many uh, in-depth uh, studies and, and, and writings and publications just about the linguistic miracle of the Qur'an. But generally, overall, you will find, as scholars explored ijaz al-Qur'an, they uh, would be able to demonstrate, and you'll see shortly, inshallah ta'ala, that really it's beyond just one uh, facet, beyond what, just one aspect of a miraculous nature. You have the knowledge of the natural world, the knowledge of the future, the, the knowledge of the past that people had not been exposed to, that only later generations people realize. You have the impact on the hearts and on societies and on nation states. You have the uh, laws of the Quran, the morality that is timeless. You have the, uh, of course, the linguistic miracle, and that itself has, you know, 50, 60 different uh, categories uh, of ijaz within it. You have the perfection of the Quran, you have the context of how it came down. All of these are examples which we'll get to. And at the end of the day, the names of the scholars you see are some of the scholars who held the opinion that, and they, they gave examples that the Quran is miraculous in multiple ways. And here are some of the ways. Now, uh, I created here, I tried my best. I'm not a very artistic person. Tried my best to, to create this type of uh, diagram. It's a type of Venn diagram, I believe. Uh, talking about these different categories, and I, I didn't include them specifically here uh, for a reason. What you see on the left are facets of Ijaz al-Quran. So when somebody asks, what do you mean the Quran is miraculous? How? What makes it a miracle? Uh, you have the literary miracle, and that's the most common one that's used. You have the knowledge of the future that no human being can possibly know. So it eliminates all, most of these will eliminate all discussions on human authorship, human attribution. Uh, you have the preservation of the Quran, the fact that it is the only preserved uh, scripture that was given to any messenger, and there are ways to prove this as well. Uh, you have the elucidations about the origin of life, the existence of God, who is the creator, names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are not things you can just rationalize. Uh, you have to know who Allah is based on what he tells us. You have the universal laws, you have the ease by which the Quran is memorized, the perfection of the Quran, no errors, no contradictions, the impact of the Quran on human beings. Uh, on one's heart and mind and body, on nation states and civilizations. All of these are examples. Um, and I, what I did with the Venn diagram is, uh, and, and the reason I did this, I'll, I'll explain. Sometimes when you read one surah, one chapter of the Quran, you might find some of these facets there, but not others. It doesn't mean that the ijaz in all of these categories and more needs to be in every single verse of the Quran. The Quran is miraculous in its entirety. And if you were to take different passages, you will find different uh, types of ijaz. The linguistic miracle is found throughout the Qur'an. This cannot be denied. The perfection of the Qur'an in terms of the uh, no, lack of errors, in terms of no contradiction, 
found throughout the Quran. The personal experiences can be in a single ayah of the Quran. In fact, can be in part of an ayah of the Quran. So you cannot really take one category and say this is in like half of the Quran, the other is in the entire Quran only. So these are all uh, different facets of irajaz, which we'll go through shortly, inshallah ta'ala. And they do impact us in different ways. And some of them will be uh, more common in the Quran and others will be limited in terms of the occurrences. And so the knowledge about the natural world, you might not find this in every verse, the knowledge of the future. You might not find this in every verse, but it is there in the Quran. It is still uh, one of the most important to consider. Now, I want to mention something that I, I think uh, will help many people as they digest this. People are impacted by these types of ijaz in different ways, by the facets of ijaz in different ways. And you don't necessarily need to go to someone and say, listen here, I have 10 examples of ijaz al-Quran, and I'm going to go through all 10, and I expect all 10 to impact you in the same way. Some people will, will struggle a lot to connect to the literary miracle of the Qur'an. There are ways to explain it in a non-Arabic research, uh, but it's not always the, the first thing that uh, clicks for someone. I've surveyed over the years many converts to Islam and many uh, Muslims who've been practicing for uh, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, sorry, uh, 10, 20, 30 years about the justifications they have for belief in the Qur'an, that the Qur'an is from Allah. And they've all given different examples. And the reason I share this is because sometimes uh, you'll find, you know, just one of these or two of these to really hit home for you. And that really suffices. And I, if you don't mind, Akhi uh, Bassam, I want to share just an example. A young man who claimed he loved Islam because of intellectual reasons. After many years, he decided to uh, finally talk about it. And he traveled from out of state and came to Michigan. I have had many people come to Michigan just to talk about uh, Islam, which is a positive sign. Uh, for them, that they're sincere taking the step. And I, I, I pray that uh, he was sincere. And I saw, you know, the fruition of that. He came to talk about his doubts and intellectual questions. And I was waiting to hear what is the thing that caused this man so much confusion, a young college student. And I thought there was going to be some philosophical argument that he was confused about and that I would have to respond to. None of that. We sat there, casual conversation. We had coffee. And then finally, uh, we spoke about, and I, I love to bring up, Ijaz al-Quran. I found it suitable once I got to know him that he related to the Quran. So it was suitable in that type of da'wah environment. We talked about 10 categories of ijaz. And when we went through these, he said, uh, after I finished, and, and there was a brother with me, another sheikh, we finished and, and I basically, like I looked at him and we're like trying to assess, like, how are you feeling? What are you thinking? He says, well, five of these, I believe he said five of these, they're so clear cut, I can't deny but I'm still struggling. I have doubts about the other four or five. So I'm not ready like to really just, and then the other sheikh just like interject. He's like, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Five of these made sense to you. And they're clear cut proofs that the Quran is miraculous. And you're, you're not moving forward because you have doubts about the other four or five. Does that make any sense to you that you're letting the doubt take the, the like the, the foundation is your doubt and everything has to make sense to you for you to move forward. All you need is one proof that the Quran is from God for you to accept it. That's all you need. One proof, if you're looking at purely an intellectual pursuit. He said, you, you already accepted four or five of these. They're very obvious. You can't deny them. And you're not yet certain about the others. We can help you explain those over the years. But you're certain about a few. Move forward. Don't be amongst those who reject and allow your foundation of certainty to be replaced with a little bit of doubt. The doubt will be cured, inshallah ta'ala. You can take care of it. But right now you have certainty about some things. As we go through these... When you find certainty, accept it. And that serves as your foundation. Nothing else should shake the entire foundation suddenly out of the blue. You're like, I don't get, you know, this 10th category or this seventh example of just It's all there. It is there. But here's another important point. Speaking to another a convert to Islam, alhamdulillah, this person had not left Islam and returned, but rather, and that brother, by the way, did become Muslim, alhamdulillah. This person converted to Islam. When we were talking about Ijaz al-Quran, he said, um, like, you know, like, I understand, like, you know, one or two, it kind of makes sense. Three and four kind of makes sense. Five is kind of, he's like, but nothing is like, like, so abundantly clear. I'm like, what do you mean by abundantly clear? He's like, you know, like, if, for example, if every time I recited the Quran, it started to float in the air, I believe it's from God. I'm like, are you serious right now? Like, that's <laughs> what you're demanding. That's your term for belief. Do you not think God is greater than that? Like the Quran just floating when you're, it's not Harry Potter, man. What are you talking about? Mm. You're reading the Quran and you're receiving from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all these proofs. Now, here's what we said to conclude. You can only deny something with a little bit of like your doubt or confusion. Maybe somebody, you know, gave you the wrong explanation of it. For so long before you say, how many different pieces of the puzzle do you need until you finally say, I, I can't ignore the overwhelming evidence. When you look at the big picture, all these examples of Ijaz, you really cannot deny that the Quran is from God. 
And this is why, you know, when I had finished the the uh, thesis that I did, I went in with this lens of uh, critique, not criticism, a critique of our arguments from a Western lens to see uh, what, what arguments are, are being brought up in counter arguments. And by the end of it, I, I literally shared with my friends and classmates and my teachers the same thing that I had started with, which is you can't say the Quran uh, that it's improbable to come from a human being. No, it's impossible to come from a human being. It's impossible. And that's why we're calling this a mu'ajiza. That's why it is miraculous. It's impossible. And I assure you, if you delve into this uh, topic, inshallah ta'ala, with a sincere heart and open mind, uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the pursuit of truth, you will find as well that you, you don't have any doubts. The Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is kalamullah. Now, yeah. one of the questions... And, uh, I mean, kind of, I mean, go ahead. I mean, it's, it's interesting how you also pointed out that, uh, you know, uh, some some facets may resonate with uh, s some people more than more than other facets. And I think there could also be some flexibility in terms of how we present these evidences, right? Uh, you know, one may see the strength of these evidences holistically as a package deal. He may look at some of the evidences. So for example, one of the evidences that was mentioned was the ease by which the Quran is memorized. One person may say, okay, this seems like a circumstantial argument to me. Uh, maybe not a very strong one, Others may say, no, it's a very strong circumstantial argument because this is a very unique aspect. Yes, that argument by itself in isolation of everything else will probably not persuade me to accept it as a divine book, but it's certainly a very good circumstantial argument. And I'm going to look at it in accumulation along with all these other different facets that you're presenting. So there may be some leeway in viewing just how definitive and compelling each of these individual arguments are, but I think undoubtedly what we're looking at here is that when looked at a, a, as a package deal of sorts or, or holistically, that the evidence is quite compelling and overwhelming. Jazakallah khairan. Absolutely. Barakallah fikum. And oftentimes that's, uh, that's that step that person needs to, to take forward. Uh, subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us sincerity in the pursuit of truth and reinforcement upon it as well. Allahumma ameen. Uh, I want to begin with uh, this question that comes up, and I will come back to it, inshallah, at the end as well. What about Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So anytime the conversation of the Ajaz al-Quran comes up, the nature of the Quran, we have to address the very obvious thing, which is what about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? Because there is a very obvious problem with those who reject belief in the Quran's divine origins, no matter how indirect their language is. There is this assumption they have about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regards to either his integrity or his sanity or his character if they are not accepting the Quran as being the word of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Because those who claim that the Quran was authored by human beings and they're ignoring everything else about Ijaz, if they're claiming the Quran is authored by Prophet Muhammad himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they're suggesting some kind of worldly motive, material gain or power, which easily is eliminated and has been refuted. And uh, it, it's not difficult to refute. Or the claims that can be refuted using historical evidence or reasoning or uh, any kind of objective uh, metrics, like the Prophet Sallallahu did not gain more of a dunya after prophethood. He lost more of a dunya and he rejected a dunya. He rejected power, rejected bribery of all types. And there are many, many academics, many non-Muslims who have uh, attempted to study life of the Prophet Sallallahu and they mistakenly would assume that he was an unrivaled genius who authored the Quran in his subconscious mind, intellectual locution, right? Or mistook it as revelation uh, from God. And th this claim is really ridiculous. Why? Because it automatically will prevent this individual from seeing that the Prophet Sallallahu is one of the biggest factors in accepting that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you've already established, as many, many uh, Westerners and others and Orientalists and others have established, his sincerity, his uh, illiteracy, that he was not uh, taught to read and write, his lack of exposure to uh, scripture. Um, and, it, it, and as many of them said, it seems that he had not read any scripture or their inability to properly and coherently explain the concept of revelation, wahi. Revelation in Islam is a little different than other uh, religions, uh, but wahi, they're trying to explain it through a secular or materialist uh, psychological lens. But the, the, at the end of the day, the Quran itself rejects all claims of human authorship. The Quran itself, in terms of i'jaz, rejects all of that. And the life of Prophet Muhammad, he's the most documented of famous figures 
in history, as many Orientalists uh, have uh, asserted. And many of them who have studied his life admitted that although it seemed that the initial uh, accusations of the Arabs of Quraysh, the pagans, uh, to reject the Quran, that they had accused the Prophet Sallallahu of authorship, they then changed their arguments to other things. And here you have an example of a response. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to respond. And just to keep it brief, I'll, I'll read the translation very quickly. When our clear revelations are recited to them, those who do not expect to meet with us, meaning with Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, will then say, bring us a different Quran or change it, badil. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was told to respond. It is not for me to change it of my own accord. I only follow what is revealed to me. And I fear the torment of a tremendous day if I were to disobey Allah. Another command, Prophet Muhammad, say the following. If Allah had willed, I would not have recited it to you, nor would he have made it known to you. I lived an entire lifetime amongst you before it, revelation, came to me. How can you then not use your reason? I lived amongst you for 40 years before prophethood began. You know that the Prophet Sallallahu did not learn from a poet. You know that there is nothing that is similar to the Qur'an. You know that nobody else in the entirety of Arabia has anything like the Qur'an. So there's nothing that matches it, nothing similar to it. It does not fit into any kind of category in terms of uh, poetry. And the Prophet Sallallahu is known as al-Sadiq al-Amin, the, the uh, trustworthy, the honest. Nobody has this nickname after 40 years of living amongst the people unless they've really built that reputation. He was a Sadiq al-Amin and they knew him for this. So I just want us to keep in mind when people talk about the Quran, uh, they are oftentimes coming with an existing as assumption. So if they were to reject different aspects of the Quran, try to come up with a different explanation for Ijaz, the sad reality is uh, they are indirectly claiming that there's an imposter theory here or that it is man-made or that the Prophet is not honest. And you have to build that foundation first. Who is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And I will come back around to this at the end. I just wanted to introduce this uh, very briefly, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, one of the, the common uh, examples of the Ijaz al-Quran, and this is something that you can read uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of pages about in dissertations and books and articles and things like that, is the linguistic miracle, which is not easy to explain. And sometimes, and I, I, I'm sorry, it's not easy to explain in the English language to, uh, or in a non-Arabic uh, research setting, because when you uh, study Arabic or the more you, you know of Arabic, and even if it's an introduction to Arabic, like you understand some basic words, you start to automatically understand the linguistic miracle that is embedded in every single ayah of the Qur'an. You find when you delve into it deeper, it's in the grammar, in the uh, structure, in the storytelling, in the syntax, in the word precision, uh, the word choice in some verses over other verses. You find uh, sometimes in the same kinds of stories in different ayat, or sorry, different surah, different passages, different words being used, and they both have their own settings for those words. And you find as well, of course, the Qur'an is... Uh, impactful on the heart when you listen to it. There are many people, there are many people who embraced Islam and when we ask them why, their answer was, I heard the Quran for the first time. I heard it and I didn't even know what it meant. Now, that may not sound convincing to someone who's skeptical and asking, well, how does that prove that it's miraculous. There are many things that move us emotionally. There are many things we listen to uh, that affect us. There's music for some people that moves them. And so you look at the the actual literary features of the Quran, the devices, the uh, you look at the, the uh, word choice as well as the conciseness in some places and elaboration in other places. You look at the perfect blend between the power of uh, emotion and reason and intellect and feeling all in one. You find in the storytelling, in the arguments, in the intellectual, in the rhetorical, in the doctrines, in the laws, the ahkam, as well as the stories about the day of judgment. All of that, you find a, a very powerful and emotive uh, force. You find that the Quran has a voice of majesty behind it. It's a very bold, strong voice consistently throughout. And there are ways in a linguistic setting uh, to demonstrate with even the shortest surah, chapters of the Qur'an, how there is uh, a, an i'jaz that a human being cannot come up with. And when you study it and you explore it, you find really it's an ocean of uh, i'jaz, an ocean of, of uh, study. But one of the best ways to explain the literary miracle in a non-Arabic uh, setting is to remember some of the following context. And I want to share maybe these two points and Feel free after that as well, Bassam, if you, you want to interject. I know this is supposed to be maybe the longest example. I want people to keep in mind the Quran was revealed and conveyed over the course of 23 uh, lunar years. Various times, different places, different audiences. And you have to keep this in mind uh, with regards to literary and non-literary categories of Ijaz. The method of delivery was verbal. Prophet 
would receive revelation and was commanded to recite. And sometimes it was conveyed, uh, the, the revelation was conveyed when a question would arise. They would come to ask Prophet Muhammad وسلم, about a certain thing, or they would come to test him and challenge him, right? So some of the, the uh, Jewish tribes of Medina would, would give the Quraysh's questions to ask the Prophet وسلم, to test him, see if he actually knows. If he knows what's in the old scriptures, there are things he won't know about, right? So one example of this is the, the oral delivery of the Quran. If I were to ask uh, anyone, uh, including myself and Bassam here, if I were to ask you like, you know, Bassam, give us like a five minute summary of like any topic you want and something you, you, you're well versed in, uh, you, you would likely give something remarkable inshallah ta'ala. But if then I were to ask you like, hey, like, can you write it as a research paper and have it reviewed by like a hundred different uh, professors? So, you know, there are no mistakes, no issues, no linguistic things, nothing of content, nothing of grammar. You, you're basically getting a final product uh, with the Quran that is verbally uh, conveyed to the people in different times, different places, disseminated to the masses and cannot be retracted. And there is no proofreading process. There is no opportunity to, to, to change. Well, hold on. I want to change what that verse says. Oh, the verse says it. It's there. People heard it. It's reported. It's memorized by a lot of people. And the Qurayshis, of course, they're listening very attentively. Any opportunity they had to jump on something, they would love to jump on it. They could not find anything. And this is why you'll find historical as well. There was not a single issue, a single thing that they could find with regards to the linguistic aspect of the Quran, with how perfect it was. They couldn't. They could mock. They could make fun of, they can start to attack physically and violate the rights of Muslims and persecute them, harass them, kick them out of their land and wage a war against them. But that's only because they could not meet the challenge of the Quran. And so this example, I know like the example of like the five minute uh, impromptu speech versus like a, a one month research paper with a hundred peer reviews. I know this is not a perfect analogy, a perfect example to the point at hand, because really with the Quran, uh, with oral delivery, there can be no mistake. The Quran is very clear about that. Allah is very clear that there are no mistakes in the Quran. So there can be no mistake in the revelation of God. It has to be perfect without errors or contradiction. And it has to harmoniously flow and intertwine the meanings with the rhythm, with the rhetorical features, with the precision in word choice. And it's being conveyed not just to followers, but to those who are challenging its origins. Any tiny slip up, any tiny thing that would even seem like an error would give its its opposition, its opponents, the upper hand would confuse the followers themselves and the, the people of Quraysh could not, uh, of course, meet that challenge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions as well, they asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about ar-ruh, the soul, وَيَسَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوْتِيتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا The soul is from the affairs of my Lord, meaning it's a matter of, of the knowledge of my Lord, and mankind has not been given of knowledge except very little. It's one of the things we know very little about. And so they would ask these direct questions. And the response came about and the response cannot be changed now. And yet when you read the Quran, sometimes these verses would flow perfectly. And this brings me to the second point. Not only was it on the spot, also it was non-chronological. Surah Al-Baqarah, the longest chapter of the Quran is 286 verses. And according to uh, Ibn Abbas, عن, Ibn Abbas's opinion was that the last ayah to be revealed nine nights before the Prophet وسلم, passed away is verse 281 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Oh, Fear the day in which you shall indeed return to Allah and every soul will be given what it earned and no one will be treated with injustice. Nobody will be wronged. Over 15 years, arguably, of Surah Al-Baqarah coming down, and yet you read this final verse and you read all the other revelations of Al-Baqarah and all of the revelations of the Quran and they flow perfectly. And this is a really important concept to keep in mind because the Quran is over 6,000 verses that have the highest order of perfection in language, in sound, in unparalleled eloquence, in composition, in organization, the nazm of the Quran. You find with many forms of literature, not just a preparation that the author has, like, you know, when, when you're an author, you prepare a lot, you have multiple manuscripts and drafts and changes, you have a beginning, middle and end usually uh, formulated in your mind, you somehow are, are going to bring about a chronological delivery after after the development of what you're doing, even with the greatest of masterpieces of literature or uh, what people uh, reference of, you know, movies or TV shows, doesn't matter what it is. No matter how creative you are in coming up with it, you can't find anything worldly to, to even closely compare to the Quran. 23 years of revelation 
non-chronologically to different audiences, to opposition as well, in, in, in front of different people, followers and opposition alike in different regions, cities and places as well. Those who memorized it as it was being conveyed, uh, you cannot take it back from them. So they were instructed by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where to place each of the newly revealed uh, passages or uh, the, the newly revealed uh, ayat. And so when you study or hear about the literary aspect of the Quran or any other aspect of i'jaz, you have to consider the perfection of it in terms of the context on the spot, as well as the non-chronological delivery. Uh, and you have to recognize as well that uh, if if you're not understanding of some of the uh, the grammar or the language or anything like that, this is something that can be learned. You may not fully appreciate it, but you'll realize the more you study the Arabic language, uh, the more you appreciate how majestic and how miraculous the, the language of the Quran is. There's a lot more to say about the uh, linguistic uh, miracle of the Quran. And I would urge you to, for those who are interested but do not speak or read Arabic at all, uh, to try to understand through uh, different types of studies and publications uh, of even the shortest chapters of the Quran, like Surah Al-Kawthar or Surah Al-Asr, uh, how there's a miraculous uh, uh, language to it, despite the fact that it is the shortest chapter in the Quran, and features that cannot be done on the spot and cannot you cannot find uh, alternatives for in terms of the word precision. You find the the, the grammatical uh, shifts as well. The iltifat is perfect in every ayah of the Quran. Uh, you find the first person, second person, third person references. You find as well that the verses that were revealed in longer chapters, uh, but not all at the same time, fit in perfectly and flow perfectly. And you find that they touch the uh, the intellectual and the emotional all at the same time in different ways. And there's also the technical of the laws and the ahkam that are uh, timeless, but this is a very short introduction to the uh, literary miracle of the Quran. And Akhi Bassam, if you want to add anything, uh, let me know, inshallah ta'ala. Otherwise, uh, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, Jazakallah khair for that. I mean, you know, a, a common uh, 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 objection that comes our way is that, well, you know, there's a lot of literary masterpieces, and, you know, people commonly put forth Sh William Shakespeare, uh, you know, as an example that. Okay, you know, uh, you know, Shakespeare is quite difficult to imitate. Shakespeare, you know, gave, you know, provided, you know, wrote things that were unprecedented in terms of their, you know, linguistic brilliance and whatnot. Um, does that alone really serve as some sort of argument just because it's a literary masterpiece or just because it's so exceptional and unique and unprecedented? I mean, so many things come into existence and are introduced to mankind because for the first time and they're unprecedented. So why can't the Quran be similar in that it is a, you know, a literary masterpiece of the Arabic language that is unprecedented and uh, just, you know, uh, the brilliant work of, you know, of, of brilliant, uh, of, you know, a brilliant human being, for example. Uh, I think that kind of objection, that, that shakes, the Shakespearean uh, objection comes our way very frequently. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, Jazakallah uh, khairan. Uh, two things. The first is, uh, for it is a very common thing that comes up as an objection. And I, I think I've had maybe a thousand conversations just on this topic because of how common it is. Uh, the first thing is that not only is the Quran unprecedented, because some things may be unprecedented, but they are not inimitable. Uh, and there's a difference between the two. So yes, the Quran is unprecedented, but also it's inimitable. And this is not just the, the claim of Muslims. There are non-Muslims, uh, academics and linguists and others who say that up to this point, the Quran has been clearly inimitable. Nothing has uh, come close to it. But that's that's not the argument I'm going to rely on here. When people ask about uh, Shakespeare, it seems like there are a lot of misunderstandings because while the works of Shakespeare are considered excellent, um, I don't I don't consider them excellent, but they're considered excellent to many people. The view of experts and academics and researchers is that the works of Shakespeare are um, not just imitable, like you can imitate them and come up with something like them, but they're in fact surpassed by many other author authors uh, who are not well known, uh, unless you're in that field and you understand uh, a lot about uh, you know uh, literature and and especially the literature of that time. Uh, so you have examples, and I wrote about this in one of my articles, where uh, Professor uh, Hugh Craig of Newcastle University ranked Shakespeare not as first or second or third in terms of the greatest English-speaking uh, playwrights. He, he categorized him as seventh 
gave him the rank of seventh behind a number of other people who are not considered inimitable either. And so the idea that he's inimitable is, is very odd. Uh, and the comparison between the works of Shakespeare and the Quran are very odd for a number of reasons. Here's why. The first, Shakespeare was uh, known to people, taught, and he had teachers. He had known teachers in uh, Greek and Latin languages. And Prophet Muhammad وسلم, never had any teachers. And this is not just the claim of Muslims, but also there are non-Muslim academics who've said this, uh, the same. Prophet Muhammad never had uh, teachers to teach him poetry or language or anything like that. The second is that uh, Shakespeare was a known playwright who continued to uh, refine his skills. So he his his uh, literature like was improving and changing. In fact, there's a study of how Shakespeare's works uh, evolved. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu never had any poetry or novels in his life, never published anything, uh, and, and never said anything in terms of anything like the Quran, never said anything before the Quran that anyone would say, well, this is building up to something greater. Furthermore, Shakespeare had the opportunity to edit and modify, proofread his works, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam could not retract the verses of the Quran for so-called you know quality control once conveyed to Muslims and, and non-Muslim audiences. The writing of Shakespeare as well, number four. The writing of Shakespeare as well was uh, precedented. It was paralleled. It, it was not the newest thing. It was great, and it's been impactful for many different reasons. And there are actually a number of. Uh, you know, unfortunate things that uh, that are known about uh, Shakespeare and, and some of the borrowing and some of the other things as well in terms of his works, or as the, the Quran's unique composition was both unprecedented and, as I said before, remains uh, unmatched, remains unparalleled. The works of Shakespeare were developed and published based on his plans, whereas the verses of the Quran came down non-chronologically over the course of 23 years, revealed at times instantaneously to various audiences. And lastly, the writings of Shakespeare are extremely limited in scope to a few uh, subjects and a few themes and a few target audiences. Whereas the Quran is a divine, multifaceted, multidimensional book of guidance affecting all human beings, affecting people who are leaning more towards the intellectual as well as fulfilling the spiritual. It uh, addresses the individual and the collective. It addresses societies in a timeless way, north, east, south, and west. And it contains knowledge of the unseen. It's conveyed through a morally upright man who lived amongst his people for 40 years, known consistently as the honest and the trustworthy. And it continues to serve that same purpose in a miraculous way, and it will until the, the end of times. So the, the argument of Shakespeare is a very weak one. Uh, and those who know a lot about, again, literature and the, the works of Shakespeare wouldn't uh, come up with, with an argument like that unless they were looking for something maybe surface level, or they maybe did not understand, uh, as you said, they did not understand what it means when we say the Quran is... Uh, a, a literary miracle, that it is beyond this world. But I, I also want people to keep in mind the following. Uh, those who believe in God and those who believe in a creator, and, and even those who don't, but, but will at least posit the, the following point. Do you imagine that the speech of God is going to be like the speech of man? Of course, the, the word of God is going to be uh, perfect, no errors, no contradictions. And if it's revealed to human beings, it's going to be revealed through somebody who is honest, not through like a pathological liar. It's going to be given through an honest person. And you know this honest person, they've known him for 40 years, has never learned. You cannot assume that this person is now suddenly lying to you and they have something that cannot be explained uh, with any human being, cannot be attributed to any human being. So I want people to consider this, this reality that the, the eloquence and perfection of the word of God cannot be compared to human speech. And that's why it's not surprising to us as Muslims when you read the Quran, we've already established we believe in God, that the Quran is, is uh, miraculous and yet it still amazes us when we study it. It still amazes us when we read it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant us humility and, and uh, steadfastness upon the truth. Barakallahu feekum. Uh, uh, another of the, the uh, quick points that I'll bring up, and I'm not going to spend so much time on this because it's addressed in different places. You find a lot of uh, presentations on the preservation of the Quran, a lot of different uh, wonderful papers and, and publications as well. Uh, but for those who don't know, uh, as Muslims, as two billion Muslims, we believe and we follow, we agree on, uh, on one Quran. We don't have multiple versions of the Quran. We don't have multiple books. We don't have multiple uh, quote unquote chapters slash gospels in which some had to be accepted or rejected in the first, second, third century after the Prophet. No, the Quran was preserved at the time of the Prophet and memorized through the companions, uh, in fact, compiled physically all in one place, although it was written down, it was compiled in one place from cover to cover, literally less than two years after the departure of the Prophet. And despite the fact that there have been many uh, types of uh, heretical or odd or, or weird groups that have become prominent and died out in history, still the same Quran. We have one version of the Quran. 
That's what we all follow as Muslims. And of course, it's not shocking or surprising that because Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the final messenger of God, it necessitates that for, for all human beings to still be able to follow him, that there needs to be some kind of message that is preserved. And so Allah promised the preservation of the final message. We have brought down, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a dhikr, the reminder, the Quran, it's one of its nicknames, a dhikr, and uh, we will, we will uh, preserve it. It is the promise of Allah that the Quran is preserved. And of course, you can study this uh, as its own uh, sub, uh, you know, topic and sub uh, category of ulum al Quran, the sciences of the Quran. This is something, uh, Subhanallah. Just recently, I I, I teach a, a class on ulum al Quran through Al Maghrib Institute, and one of the students uh, reached out afterwards, uh, and they shared that they had become Muslim only because uh, they were introduced to the preservation of the Quran. So the first time they heard that the Quran is unchanged. They said their entire lives, they were confused as Christians as to how they can justify following the New Testament, knowing that there are many uh, vague and confusing things about its history, as well as many problematic things from uh, from an objective lens in terms of preservation, in terms of uh, what you accept and what you reject, in terms of the authors, in terms of changes o- over time. And so they said, it's so odd to me how I was following a book that I cannot guarantee is from God or even inspired uh, to those uh, first uh, disciples uh, and others uh, from God. But when it came to the Qur'an, I did not know that Muslims believe in the same Qur'an that was revealed to Prophet Muhammad. And so this student, uh, a woman in her 40s in the United States of America, for her this was sufficient. And this is a very common uh, sentiment, a very common thing that uh, converts share with us. It was a very easy uh, entryway into Islam. That, you know, this is unchanged. And of course, they, they looked into it. Really, it's unchanged. Is that really the case? You all believe in the same Quran? We believe in the same Quran. So when we talk about the translations of the Quran, we say these are translations of the Quran. Attempts to explain the meaning of the Quran. The Quran is one. It is in Arabic. It is Kalam Allah. It is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is unchanged. And uh, th- this is something that is important for many people because they want to know uh, that what they're they're following is the same message, that human beings did not interfere with it. And one time I was talking to someone who was asking about, uh, like, you know, the signs of God. He wants to, you know, explore Islam further. And he said, well, I would believe in something if I knew that people didn't meddle with it, because what I know of, of my tradition, my history as a Christian, he said, it, it's uh, it's been meddled with in so many different ways. So this guy went through agnosticism and Buddhism and Christianity. He said, but I, I can't rely on the New Testament. I just can't justify it. There are too many problematic things that cannot be resolved. And so he said, I'm look, I was looking for something that was perfect, but I didn't know Muslims believe in one Qur'an, that it is preserved and it is the same Qur'an that Prophet Muhammad and the companions would recite, uh, radiallahu anhum. So for him, that was uh, an entryway and a catalyst to uh, learning about and becoming Muslim, alhamdulillah. But again, a, a longer discussion, maybe for another time. How is this miraculous? Uh, through all the wars and battles of humanity and, and history, through all the different uh, you know, uh, natural disasters, the different things that could have happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to preserve the Qur'an. And you find going back to the earliest of generations, uh, the preservation was not uh, was not only written; uh, it was memorized by a lot of people. It was memorized. So it, when you when it reaches a point where so many people are memorizing it, there's uh, a level of certainty with mass transmission, what might be called uh, tawatul, but without specifying number, there was mass transmission, mass memorization of the Quran. So nobody could doubt. So many nobody could change. Nobody could interfere with or meddle with. It's the word of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So it's not uh, shocking to us. And then this brings me to. Uh, what might what might seem to be a purely intellectual and rational argument for Ijaz al Quran, and I say it might seem because people take these things in different ways. Uh, I recently wrote and submitted; it's not been published yet. A very lengthy paper on knowledge of the future in the Quran. We talk about this, and usually people hear about this when it comes to hadith. Right? There are so many hadith, the narrations of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam about the future that came true. And you can only ignore these evidences for so long before you say, well, where is this knowledge coming from? You know, if somebody said one hadith, there was only one hadith out of like 10,000, and it was uh, it was about the future, and it came true, someone would say, well, it was just a lucky guess. That's not right to say. But they might argue that this is just one-off uh, you know, situation. You have 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 examples of authentic hadith. They've been authenticated a long time ago, and they've been fulfilled in many different ways throughout history and some only in recent times. Until when will someone you know, deny that this knowledge is coming from the unseen? It's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The same goes for the Qur'an. 
I explored this in really uh, in a lot of detail, and I found that um, most of the the studies, most of the, most of the books, even in Arabic, focus on the Hadith more than the Quran. And the Quran, uh, they would list very quickly examples. Even Ibn Taymiyyah listed a dozen examples, but did not go into a lot of depth, uh, which I feel is something uh, worth exploring. And that's why I wrote about it. Um, and it, it would suffice as uh, as a fulfillment of this category. Knowledge of the future, where does it come from? And so I asked one time uh, an ex-atheist. He became um, a, a deist and then became Muslim later. And I know it's a weird transition. It's it's for another time, inshallah ta'ala. But I, I asked him what would convince him that the Qur'an is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, if the Qur'an has information about the future and it came true and you can prove historically that it came true, I'll believe in it. I said, that's it? It's like, that's that's the that's one of the main proofs for me that's like very obvious. And I, I told you earlier, a lot of people, um, they'll resonate with different aspects of the Ajaz al-Qur'an. And as you said, Bassam, this is a category that for some reason, a lot of people do incline to, maybe because it seems like a very uh, pure, uh, rational, intellectual one, rather than uh, addressing it with the heart or the fitrah. But the common the common example is Surah Al-Rum. But before I, 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 I talk about Surah Al-Rum, I want to give some quick context um, and, and I want to do share that, by the way, prophecies, knowledge of the future is considered a miracle because human beings cannot imitate it. They cannot do it. And it's a link to a prophet, a specific prophet. Uh, so it is considered a miracle. And I, I write about this in depth, inshallah ta'ala, when that paper is published, we can share it. Uh, what is the, the, the point here? You look at the second bullet point, and I'm trying to summarize as best as I can. This is a much longer discussion. From 602 to 628, common era, uh, there were the Roman Persian battles and the Roman Byzantines here and, and the Persians as well. They were the two superpowers of the time. I'm going to summarize as much as I can for the sake of time. 602 to 615, there were a number of Persian conquests. They are taking over city after city after city. And I had to go through book after book after book from historians, non-Muslim historians for the most part, who are experts when it comes to the Persian Empire and experts when it comes to Byzantine history. And as I went through, I believe, over 10,000 pages of, of research just on this one uh, subject, I found that they all came to the same kinds of conclusions. And they all shared the, the same kind of history. So there's no contradiction here. The Persians were absolutely dominating and destroying the Roman Byzantine Empire. And in 614, they captured the area of Jerusalem. They captured later on 615, Asia Minor, areas of Turkey today. And I, I just want everyone to remember this. Uh, this is known. Heraclius, the emperor of the, the Romans, was willing to concede, there were concessions, was willing to surrender and to turn the Roman Byzantine the cities that survived to turn the existing state into a client state of the Persian Empire. So he literally surrendered and he took permission from the uh, Senate, the Roman Senate, to surrender. And they presented this basically proposal to Kisra II that they, they want to surrender, but they want to survive and they want to be client states of the Persians. You'll find this in a number of different, uh, you know, uh, prominent books. And, and these are, again, experts in this area. And they are non-Muslim, so there's no claim of bias here, although that's that's a, a ridiculous claim. Okay, so what happens here in 615, 616, is her, uh, Kisra rejected the, the offer. And the two main uh, historians that I was reading, both about the Persians and about the uh, Romans, both of these experts said, and they're both non-Muslim, Walter Cagey is one of them, they both said that the the Roman Empire was basically on the verge of collapse. Now, I want you to imagine an empire that's being wiped out city after city, and people are dying, and cities are being conquered. Kisra rejects the offer, and he continues expanding. Here's where I want us to pause what's happening between those two superpowers, and to turn to what's happening in Arabia. What happened in Arabia, this is before the Hijrah. The Hijrah, the migration was in 622. What happened in the latter years of the Meccan Dawah, in the Meccan years, is the revelation of Surah Al-Rum. So I'll go forward, show you the example of what came down. Surah Al-Rum, the first seven verses. Alif Lamin, Ghulibat Al-Rum. The Romans have been defeated. Which defeat is this referring to? There were many battles that they had lost. Now, again, it was a series of, of, of wars and battles. So you cannot claim, well, there was another battle another time, so this doesn't make sense. No, there are multiple battles. But generally... People knew, and historians have stated today as well, the Romans were defeated at that time. They were defeated in a nearby. Adna has two connotations, nearby and close and also in a low land. But after their defeat, they will triumph. They will be victorious. When the knowledge of the future here makes it very clear, 
within three to nine years. A quick tangent here. Somebody asked me once, why does the Quran say three to nine years and it doesn't tell us the exact year? Well, the Quran doesn't have to tell you the exact year. There's a reason, a wisdom for why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, but it's not weird because even in English you say a decade, a century, within a decade means one to 10 years, or it doesn't mean in 200 years. You say within a century, it's up to a hundred years. So these are normal expressions that we use. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Muslims and the non-Muslims, the people of Quraysh who are attacking the Muslims, that within three to nine years, the Roman Empire will rebound. Bid'i is used elsewhere in the Quran, I believe in Surah Yusuf as well. And Bid'i is, is a common word, is a common usage at that time. And it's, again, a, a, a measure of time, right? So you say three to nine years, but it cannot be more than 10. The end of the nine years basically is the cutoff. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guaranteeing this. This is a promise of Allah at the beginning of a, a surah that's all about promises of Allah and all about the afterlife and the end of the surah as well. Fasbir inna wa'ad Allahi haq. This is the promise of Allah. I'm going to go back now. And, and, and I want to just stress, sorry, but it's yes. good to stress on the fact that ayah three is explicitly clear that's using the future tense. Because I had a couple of people in the past telling me, "Oh, well, maybe this ayah was revealed after it all happened." Well, if it was yes. revealed uh, revealed after it all happened, you know, obviously uh, this is going to read wrong and it's going to, you know, uh, come across as extremely strange to everyone. And people at the time would have called out the Prophet ﷺ on that, if that was the case. So the, the ayah is explicitly clear that it's talking about something that will happen. And, uh, you know, we just have to yeah. remember that. Jazakallah mm. So yes, in Arabic, they will triumph, meaning this is in the future uh, tense. And, and I was going to basically add to this, uh, sorry, I was going to add to this, the, the following context, what was happening at this time. And this is how you know this is the future context. The, the pagans of Mecca, by the way, for those who, who don't know and, and maybe even wonder and are skeptical, how do you know that's when it was revealed? Even non-Muslim historians and uh, so-called experts of the Quran like Theodore Noldek and others, they also attributed the revelation of Surah Al-Rum to the Meccan era. So it was not after 622. This was while the Romans had been defeated. So going back to the context here, the pagans of Mecca, their reaction, you'll find this in many authentic narrations. Again, there's an authentic, rigorous uh, process here in terms of the, the authentication of hadith. They uh, made fun of the Muslims, first of all. And the Prophet them guaranteed the companions they will, the Romans will triumph. They will rebound. Authentic hadith. Prophet is guaranteeing it in another uh, authentic report. And by the way, why were they so happy? Why were the pagans so happy? Because they related more to the Zoroastrians of the Persian Empire and the Christians, the Romans uh, who are Christian, the Christians are similar and close to, uh, as people of the book, Ahlul Kitab, close to the Muslims. So it's as though like, hey, your people, your side of things, your people are getting defeated. And maybe it also means you're next. Maybe in the future, you'll be defeated. This is in Mecca. They're already going through harassment, persecution, torture, uh, the, the, the attacks that they, you know, some of the family members had because they, they converted to Islam. So what happened during this time in the authentic report of Abu Bakr radiallahu an is that they were willing to wager on it. You're telling us your friend, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is saying that the Romans will rebound within three to nine years. They were willing to bet on it. Now, people don't bet for, for very, uh, you know, random reasons. They were willing to bet 100 camels. I want you to imagine in our times, like 100 really, really nice cars. By the way, some camels are nicer than cars. Why? Not because they're camels, but rather uh, it's a napa, it's a she camel. So we'll give birth to another camel. So it's like a car that produces a car. Anyways, 100, 100 uh, camels, I was going to say 100 cars. They were willing to wager. And they told Abu Bakr, since it's Bidl Isinin, three to nine years, how about we meet in the middle? So they said, how about five or six years? He accepted the offer. He went and told Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told him, why did you accept the Abu Bakr? He said, Bidl Isini is up to nine years. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knows the promise of Allah is true, but Allah does not say six years. Allah said up to Bidl Isini, nine years. So go back and increase the wager. By the way, the hadith mentions this is before betting was forbidden, just in case anybody wonders. So Abu Bakr went back to them, increased the wager, and they, they, they added basically the, the hundred uh, camels to it. And that's how confident the Meccans were. I want to pause here and I want people to think about what's happening because during this time, the, the historians say the, the Roman Byzantine Empire, it, it's just, there's no way anyone would assume that it's going to come back. Nobody would assume it's going to rebound. When you study uh, the, the histories of empires, no, you would never assume it's coming back. And you might think, oh, is this a lucky guess? One time an evangelical missionary came to Dearborn, Michigan, where we have a large concentration of Muslims. And he came to the mosque and he told me, I want to talk to you afterwards about Islam. I thought he wanted to ask about Islam because that's what he asked. 
And I went and met with him at a public cafe. And as we're sitting out there, he had this book in front of him. He's a missionary. He came with a very specific mission as an evangelical. And he's like, uh, why do you believe in Islam? And I told him uh, the Quran. I had just finished my thesis that I had been referencing. I had just finished it. So it was all fresh. He's like, well, what, what is it about the Quran? Like, for example, do you believe the Quran has knowledge of the future? It's a very odd question. I said, uh, yeah, I can give you examples of that. He's like, let me guess, the Romans? I said, yeah, the Romans. So it looks like you already know what I'm going to say. He's like, yeah, that's ridiculous. He's like, see in this book, and I, I don't even want to mention the book. It's so ridiculous. It, it's academic. Academically, it's just trash. No citations, no nothing. It's just all trash. He's like, in this book, it says, this is like two NBA teams, basketball teams, playing in the playoffs. You play seven games, right? Mm -hmm. So he's like, one team won the first week, and the next week, the other team won. What's the big deal with guessing mm -hmm. that the other team is going to win? I said, did you really just compare two superpowers and empires attacking each other, one being almost wiped out with all these casualties and losses to a basketball team? Is that your academic comparison? Is that like something that you're basing your, your, your belief on? He's like, well, no, that, that's a weird example. I'm like, look at the book that you just gave me. Is there a citation for, for these arguments? And he looked at no citations at all. I'm like, what kind of guess do you think this is? When you take a step back and the Quran is very clear about where it's coming from, that it's from God, and very clear that you will never find an error in the Quran, a contradiction, a mistake. There can't be guesses. There cannot be lucky things. And what, what do you assume is, is luck when it comes to an empire that had just surrendered, was willing to become a client state, according to historians, were willing to surrender fully, had lost between 602 and 615, and I, in fact, actually up to 619 in Egypt. They lost so many cities, major cities. You think it was a guess? How many yeah. guesses do you think the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Technically, he put, you know, from a naturalistic lens, all his eggs in one basket with t yes. taking this huge risk, you know, portraying it as he's not just giving his own personal opinion here about what he thinks will happen, but, you know, that this was actual revelation. So to risk it all, to risk it all, if he knew that he was a false prophet, that does not seem to, to make sense. And at the same time, it appears that there wasn't any naturalistic basis upon which he would even take like an educated guess. It's not like the Romans invented, you know, cannons and, it will, and everyone's saying, okay, they invented this nice new weaponry right now. They're definitely going to make a comeback. There was no naturalistic basis upon which, you know, anyone would even make such a prediction anyways. So yeah, it's, it's definitely Absolutely. a fallacious analogy. Yeah, subhanAllah, it's, it's, it's so ridiculous uh, when, when people bring that up. Um, in, in fact, that same year that they migrated, the Muslims migrated, I want everyone to remember this, they migrated to Medina. And at this time, they uh, they did not yet see the fruition of this. Uh, you want to call it a prophecy, you might, but it's it's foreknowledge, the knowledge of Allah yeah. subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not, um, you know, just, uh, it's not a human being, like seeing into the future in some weird way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us what will happen. So the Muslims had migrated to Medina, and at this point, uh, the historians that I, that I was going through their text, Parvana is, is a known a historian of the uh, Persian Empire. She wrote about and published about it a number of times. Uh, she wrote about this. The Persians were poised for world dominion at this time. That's how strong they were. So at the time, the, the revelation already came down. The wager had taken place. The Romans were being defeated left and right. Cities were being conquered. People were dying. Soldiers were being uh, killed all over the, the uh, Persian Empire was uh, ready basically for world uh, dominion. And I want you to imagine you were a Muslim. I want anyone here to imagine you were a Muslim in the Meccan years. And this surah came down and you're like looking around. These people are mocking you. But Allah's promising you that this will happen. In fact, he mentions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, it is a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. la Allah. Allah never fails in his promises. So this is not a guess. This is Allah's knowledge subhanahu wa ta'ala being shared with us about what will happen in the future. What happened? Between years 622 to 627, the Roman Empire rebounded. I delved into the questions of why, and I found a number of different reasons. They are not important for the discussion here in terms of why the Persian Empire started to suffer and struggle internally with many different things, as well as what the Roman strategy was when they were willing to surrender and they were being wiped out. Long story short, the main point is what the Persians, uh, sorry, the Romans did rebound.
That's the point here. They rebounded and they recaptured a number of major cities. By 624, they had in fact invaded uh, one of the most important cities and they destroyed some of the fire temples of the, the Persians, one of the main shrines. So uh, this means it's symbolic. Like when they when they would take over a major city at that time and destroy a shrine, it's very symbolic. Like we've taken over something very uh, important to you. That means we've made a lot of progress. You couldn't protect that thing that was important to you. This was in 624. 624 is also the year of the Battle of Badr. So the Muslims rejoice in the very first battle that they experience, the, 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 the most decisive and first, uh, sorry, a decisive and very important battle in the beginning of their years in Medina, the second year after the uh, Hijrah. Again, 622, 624, 626, there was a siege of Constantinople. So it could be any one of these, but the Byzantine Empire was weakened, what, what was mentioned by the historian was weakened up to this point in 626 beyond recognition. And all of these battles, when the Romans had uh, rebounded, led to, in fact, uh, the, the slow decline of the Persian Empire, which later just declined altogether and uh, ended altogether. So this all took place from 622, the years of the migration, all the way to 627, and those battles between the two empires uh, ended. And long story short, the Romans rebounded, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and here's what the Muslims said, reported by a Tirmidhi, one of the companions said, the day that the news reached the Arabs, the news of what? The news that the Romans had rebounded. The day that the news reached us, it was authentically reported that many people embraced Islam. The report of a Tirmidhi. The question is, why did people rejoice? People rejoiced for a number of reasons. The first is because the truth was made clear. The Quran uh, was proven once again that it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It proved the veracity and the, the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so his prophethood. It also was a victory for the people of the book, Ahlul Kitab, over the Zoroastrians. It also signaled the weakening and decline of the Persian Empire and the strength, the forthcoming strength of the uh, Muslims. There was also a rejoicing uh, for the Battle of Badr that the Muslims uh, enjoyed. And also this was about, uh, in a way, the uh, downfall of Kisra II, and this uh, coincided for the believers with the Treaty of uh, Hudaybiyah later on. But long story short, I want those who imagine they were in Mecca to not imagine the day that the news reached them. No way. The Roman Byzantine Empire that was almost wiped out is now, uh, is now victorious. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, as came down to us years ago, the promise was fulfilled. And as Allah says, Allah, la This is the promise of Allah. Allah never fails in his promise, but most people know not. And they're, one of the wisdoms of a revelation like this, because a lot of times people ask, well, why did this have to happen? Like, why was there foreknowledge? Why was there knowledge of the future that Muslims had to experience and the non-Muslims as well who converted to Islam on that day because they saw clearly this is from God? I want us to think about just the, the reality of human beings that when somebody tells you something about the future, uh, it's amazing when it comes true. But when somebody tells you something about the future that is highly unlikely from a naturalistic, secular lens, and it comes true, it's even more shocking. Uh, it's even more convincing. It's even more To be that impactful. confident too. To be that confident to lose it all, right? Uh, as yes, well. all, like you said, all the eggs in with everything. You got to look at it in one basket. Excellent, excellent. And uh, there are other examples, by the way. And, and of course, it's not the time and place to delve into just one category of Ajaz. You have the example of Sayyuhzamul Jam'u wa Yuwallun al Dubr, the Battle of Badr that the Muslims would uh, be victorious at. And again, that coincided with the victory of the, the Romans. And this came down in the night before the Battle of Badr. Umar ibn Khattab, عن, he mentioned that the Prophet uh, led them outside and he said he showed us where the enemies at Badr would fall and die. So he would place his hand on the ground and say, uh, so and so uh, will fall here or die here tomorrow, inshallah, by the will of Allah. And he would go to another place on the ground, say, so and so will fall here, inshallah. There are many other examples like this. But the Prophet وسلم, on that day of Badr, he went out and he was wearing his, his armor and he recited, they will flee and they will be running in multitudes. This is referring to the thousand plus of the Qurayshis versus the 313 of the Muslims. Umar ibn Khattab says, I swear by the one who sent him with the truth, none of them, those enemies at Badr, fell other than exactly where the Prophet's hand had touched, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he also said about this, as one other companion reported too, he said, when this was revealed initially, I was trying to understand who is Al-Jam? Who are the people who will be running and fleeing? He said, when the Battle of Badr took place, I realized the promise of Allah. I realized that it was referring to uh, the, the, the uh, Qurayshis that were attacking. And 
on and on and on. Many other promises in the Quran. What do these promises of Allah do? They reinforce the, the faith of those who are Muslims. They also uh, were a clear uh, evidence and sign against those who rejected the Quran. Where do you explain this coming from? What are you explaining this as? If, if you're uh, hesitant, why are you not accepting the Quran? What's your hesitation? This is clearly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The confidence, the claim, the explicit uh, details of the claim and many other claims of the Quran as well. What more do you need? There was a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well about uh, the uh, liberation of Mecca, that you will enter Mecca. I mean, you will enter uh, in safety and security. All of these promises came true. So this is why the early Muslims had the strongest of Iman. They witnessed these things happening. However, there were many other promises that took place later on. One of the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding Ijaz al-Qur'an, قُلْ لَإِنْ اجْتَمَعَتِ الْإِنْسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَىٰ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِهِ وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضٍ ظَهِيرَ Say, O Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if all human beings and the jinn were to come together to produce the equivalent of this Qur'an, they could not produce its equal no matter how much they supported one another. That promise has been fulfilled up to this point and it will continue to be fulfilled until the end of times. Again, a lot more to say about this uh, particular topic, but there are many examples of foreknowledge in the Qur'an that was witnessed and can be proven historically as well uh, through a number of different evidences for those who are interested in those who incline towards it. Wallahu ta'ala, Adam. And again, here are the verses of Surah al -Rum. This is a topic I will be very brief with, inshallah ta'ala, unlike the last one. A lot of people ask, does the Qur'an contain scientific miracles? Scientific miracles, such an interesting uh, area of literature. Uh, I want us to be very cautious because unfortunately, there are many people who have taken this idea of scientific miracles uh, to a place that is not correct in da'wah, in calling people to Islam or talking about the Qur'an. There are verses in the Qur'an that talk about, speak about the natural world. This is true. There are many verses like this and many other, many different contexts. Like some of them are about traveling throughout the world. Some of them are about every leaf that falls. Some of them are about the mountains as pegs, autada. Sure, there are many verses like this. And then there are some verses that people look at and say, well, this could not have been known by any human back then. But scientifically, it was discovered in a later century, 15th century, 19th century, 20th century, that such and such is true in the in the, the world of, uh, let's say, in the, in the empirical uh, world. And they'll say, well, that's a very clear sign that the Quran was talking about a scientific thing, and the knowledge could not have been known to human beings, therefore the Quran is from God. That's usually the argument that, that they follow. Um, I want to caution Muslims from using the... Um, uh, the number of different texts and uh, da'wah series and videos about the scientific miracles of the Qur'an, because unfortunately, many have backfired. Unfortunately, some of them stretch interpretations. Unfortunately, some of them are based on like uh, English translation or, or, or um, a stretch of the tafsir of that verse that the verse is not explicitly talking about. Um, and the reason this is important is twofold. The first, you don't want to claim something that is untrue about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech. The Qur'an is a book of guidance. It's not a book of science or math or anything else. It, it, we are not in need of scientific miracles literature at all to prove that the Qur'an is from Allah. We don't need that. That's the first point. The second is because science uh, is not one thing. So when you study the philosophy of science, you find you study the scope of science. What does science say? What does it not? What is science? What is not science? You look at the boundaries as well. You look at theories and models and predictions. You look at what's considered um, uh, definitive sometimes in terms of a fact. You look at what's highly confirmed versus uh, inconclusive and insignificant in terms of confirmation. There's the problem of induction. Inductive reasoning uh, has many issues in it. So when you look at science, it's not one thing. For you to claim an ayah is a scientific miracle, uh, is very problematic. Having said that, if if someone were to claim uh, today uh, a verse of the Quran talking about, let's say, uh, embryology, if somebody would say this verse and, and the other verses well, that talk about al-alaqa and nutfa, all of this, uh, the process, that this is something that could not have been known to people, and it's spoken about so boldly and clearly and explicitly in terms of the process, uh, without like getting uh, hung up on the word alaqa, hung up, uh, pun unintended here, without getting hung up on it. Uh, if the theory were to change later, that would be problematic because you claimed the Quran was talking about that particular scientific theory, but then the scientific theory was superseded by another. And the same goes for the Big Bang theory. 
Is there a verse of the Quran that explicitly talks about something that is like the Big Bang? You have to be very cautious here. And sure, yes, there's a, a there's a, a claim. Uh, sorry, there's a, a clear reference in the Quran to the universe, Samawati, you know, the beginning of Surah Fusilat, as you know, the smoke uh, in terms of the components, the elements in terms of the uh, they, everything came out of it. But for you to claim that's talking about the Big Bang theory is risky because the Big Bang theory could be uh, changed, it could be modified, could be superseded. There was a steady state explanation all the way up to the early 1900s. So just be very cautious. That's my point about scientific miracles. And more importantly than just being cautious, trust me, we are not in need of this category to justify and to believe the Quran is from God. Every other category of just suffices. There are a few areas that I find interesting and I believe are, are interesting to keep in mind. One of them is the, the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ uh, We created uh, out of water every living being. The reason I find this interesting is because even according to the original tafsir, sorry, the classical tafsir of the older times, uh, people could not have assumed, or sorry, st uh, stated so explicitly that all living beings are created from uh, water. You could not have claimed that unless you knew that for sure. And I, I, I want us to just remember, as uh, as you said, Bassam as well, um, every verse of the Quran has to be correct. Meaning what? While you may find verses about the natural world that are not related to scientific theories or uh, claims or anything else, the Quran will never be wrong about the natural world. The Quran will never be wrong about the natural world. So when you look at it from that lens, it's important to, to keep that in mind. Why? Every living being is created out of water. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. And the argument here goes uh, that uh, people could not have known until the 18th century, 19th century, the discovery of the cells, 1665, the original cell theory in uh, the 1800s as well, was like 200 years after this. And there's uh, no disagreement generally, currently, in the scientific community, uh, that such a discovery was impossible before the 1700s, and that uh, cells contain water, 70% uh, or more in, in some cases. But the, the, the question that usually comes up is, what if people had already uh, guessed this before? What if people had known this in society? Well, the first thing that we say is the Quran can never be wrong about the natural world. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second is if there were similar things that were stated, it's not a uh, proof that this was taken from similar things. You have to, in fact, prove that there's a link between two similar things. I'll give you an example. Uh, the Quran says many things that were also meant are still found in the Old Testament or New Testament. It doesn't mean the Quran took from the Old Testament or New Testament. In fact, we can easily refute that and that has been refuted and that's not the context of our discussion today. But for someone to claim that the idea that all living beings are, are created from water was taken from someone else is a far-fetched claim. In fact, I did write a, an academic uh, article about this. I did not publish it, unfortunately, but now I'm motivated to, inshallah ta'ala, uh, about the philosopher known as uh, Thales, some pronounce his name as Thales, uh, it's, it's a very ridiculous claim, and I'll just say this about it. When people say this existed before, or uh, medicine, or embryology, that it was taken from people before, one of the most ridiculous things is, is that you, you look uh, historically at what the Prophet ﷺ knew, was exposed to, uh, and who he was as well in terms of his integrity, and you find the Qur'an is not saying the exact same thing, first of all. There, there may be similarities, but the Qur'an is not saying the same thing. And second of all, uh, for those who don't know about the, the philosopher uh, Thales, he said a lot of things. And in fact, what he said, he's a philosopher uh, who rejected what people were following uh, in terms of Greek mythology, belief in multiple uh, deities. He was looking for an explanation in something of the natural world. He was looking for a naturalistic explanation. But he wasn't leaving out the idea of deities or, or divinity. In fact, he believed, so this is why the claim is so ridiculous when people bring this up. He believed that water was inherently divine and creative. So the gods were like in the water and the water was the essence of all life and everything would return to water. Is that what the Quran says? No, of course not. And so in addition to this, uh, Thales believed that the earth floated as a flat disk on water. Is that what the Quran took as well? No, of course not. Uh, he believed that this would explain that the earth was on floating water. This would explain the process behind uh, earthquakes and uh, the waves as well. And he, he found some uh, idea of divinity to the waves and how powerful and expansive the ocean was. So he, he argued that all things are full of gods. So he was looking for an element to explain the idea of gods. And he looked at the earth and fire and air and water, and he thought water was the most obvious one. And, and here's a really important side note. His main student 
uh, Anaximander, his main student rejected this. He said that that's not correct. He rejected it. So the, the philosophers of his time didn't even agree with him about his theories uh, that everything is made of water, will return to water, that water is like the gods, it is divine, rather than thinking of figures, uh, Greek mythology, think of specific figures, uh, and also that the earth was floating uh, on water. He rejected this, he came up with his own theory, but then his student, uh, I believe uh, Anaximenes, uh, maybe that's how his name is pronounced, his student went back to Thales theory that it has to be an element, that all things come from one element, but he said it's not water. Why? Because he said water and fire, you cannot uh, combine the two together. Basically, you cannot have fire if water is the essence of all things. So he said the the uh, element that is the foundation, the source of all life, and it is divine, he said is air. So he rejected another philosopher, Thales. He rejected his own teacher, Anaximander, and he came up with his own theory. And he he said the arche, which is the uh, basically the essence of life, according to these philosophers, uh, is not water. And most importantly is this. I'm not just pointing out that it, that it was rejected by other philosophers, um, there is no link between the Muslims of Arabia and Thales. There's no link at all. This is not something any of the Muslims uh, understood. And Thales did not say living beings are from water and, and then left it at that. No, Thales said many things that are completely wrong and, and in fact, just uh, contradictory to what we know today about physics and the earth and science and many other things. So why would someone claim the Prophet Muhammad took a theory of Thales, which you cannot establish that link to yeah. begin with, it did not exist in, in Mecca at all, took one theory of one philosopher, why did he not take the one of air or fire or the theory of somebody else? And like, he didn't just take the theory, he made it correct and rejected mm -hmm. everything wrong about it. And then he also placed it in a book in which every single verse must be true and cannot be wrong and it would have to withstand the test of time, which now we know 17th century onwards that every living being has uh, water within it. So it's a really ridiculous claim for somebody to say, well, maybe the Quran barred from uh, Thales or the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam barred. This wouldn't make any sense. There is no guesswork in the Quran. How uh, would... I guess, yeah, I guess, the, I guess the, cri the critic, he could he could attempt to tweak the argument by saying, okay, fine, I'm not going to say that you, you know, that you know the Prophet um, necessarily plagiarized the idea from Thales. However, the what the point I'm trying to make is I'm playing devil's advocate here is that if it's possible for someone like Thales to posit the idea, and yet we do not claim that he got it from div, uh, you know a divine source, then likewise it could also be pro uh, possible that the Prophet Muhammad posited the same idea. And it didn't come from a divine source. But at the same time, I do think that you also preemptively, you know, disarm that response by pointing out that, first of all, this view wasn't the scientific consensus at the time. So why did the Prophet ﷺ happen to selectively cherry pick this opinion over that other opinion constantly when it comes to all the other, uh, you know, scientific facts that could be mentioned in the Quran? Same thing when it comes to Galen, right? You know, okay, so the yeah. Quran mentions certain facts about embry uh, embryological process, and so did Galen. There might be some similarities there, but at the same time, how is it the, the case that the Quran neglected or evaded the mistakes that Galen yes. committed? And similar, as you just pointed out right now, how did it selectively evade the errors of Thales? So even if we grant for the sake of argument that this is what Thales was saying, as you pointed out, he did also mention many things that were incorrect, which the Quran avoided and neglected to mention. So even in that, bearing that in mind, how is it the case that the Quran is mentioning certain facts that are not broadly agreed upon by the experts of that time and evaded all the errors? So that also demands explanation. Excellent. Jazakallah khair. You, you actually perfectly summarized it. In other words, it, uh, there's an assumption again about who the Prophet was, وسلم, right? When people say, well, maybe it was taken from somebody else. Automatically, you're assuming the imposter theory, which already we, we took care of. But more importantly than that, uh, there can't be anything wrong in the Quran, meaning the Quran speaks very boldly, very confidently. It is the voice of God that there are no mistakes. And so, yeah, the question is like, how would you claim that there was, which there is no link, but how would you claim that something was uh, borrowed, plagiarized, and then uh, modify to only take what would be correct, 100% accurate for uh, basically for, forever until the end of times. And it wouldn't be discovered until 1,400 years later, uh, sorry, at least 1,200 years after the Quran, that this was uh, correct. And it was, again, uh, there is a distinction between what the Quran says and what Thales was saying or Galen when it comes to embryology. Uh, th these are very important points for us to keep in mind. There's no guesswork. 
uh, like the, the example of the Romans, how many things do you want to claim are perfectly guessed and modified and taken from others? And the consensus, there wasn't even consensus. This was not even a thing people believed in. And if anything, the Prophet was in the middle of a desert. Are you to believe all living beings with confidence, with uh, explicit uh, claim that all living beings are created from water? Uh, it's a very far-fetched thing to assume that all of this is perfect guesswork from beginning to end 6,000 verses alongside everything else that was already mentioned before. Jazakallah khairan, akhi basam. And the, the last one that I'll mention here, uh, since you kind of uh, you, you kind of commented on the embryology one a bit, uh, expansion of the universe. Somebody asked me about this. Uh, وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ The verse says, وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the, the heavens, بِأَيْدٍ وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ And indeed we are, uh, and مُوسِعُون here means several things, uh, we are able to expand it as we will. Does this refer to the universe's expansion? So in the early 1900s, uh, there was a, basically a belief and a, a claim, a theory that the galaxies were moving away from the earth at uh, massive uh, velocities. So the, 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 the first empirical basis took place in the early 1900s that supported a theory of the universe constantly expanding. And just a few years after this, Einstein as well formulated the general theory of relativity, indicated that the universe was either expanding or contracting. And then in 1929, uh, Hubble's law was established and the belief in the scientific scientific community at that time was that the th the theory, at least, was that the uh, universe was in continuous expansion, and this is still something that many scientists believe. However, la musirun, we don't need to take contemporary tafsir to to say, oh, okay, this is referring to a constantly expanding universe. Science just discovered it, therefore, we already know about this. This is a scientific miracle. Wa inna la musirun can mean we expand it as we desire. The oldest tafsir I could find about this was from Al Muqatil bin Sulayman died in 767 common era. And his, to translate, his uh, tafsir says that the verse is saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to expand it. We are able to expand it. We in the royal here, we are able to expand it as we desire. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, I can expand the universe as I wish. Uh, we are able to expand it as we will. You take this from Asamar Qandi. Al Mawardi said, We are able to expand the heavens more than it is already expanded. Uh, Tabarani as well died 970. He says, This means we expand the heavens in every direction. So there is there was an understanding that Allah subhanahu wa is expanding the heavens in other directions. But to, to say that it's clearly about the uh, expansion of the universe as a theory and that this is something that no human being uh, could have known and that's what it's referring to as a theory, Allah knows best, but we should say this. Uh, the verse is not wrong. So the most important thing is that there cannot be anything incorrect about the natural world. The Quran is perfect and correct and accurate in every single verse of the Quran. And that's what I want us to, to keep in mind when we talk about the natural world, rather than making a lot of links uh, between the uh, scientific, which could change at times, and what the Quran uh, is actually uh, saying. Uh, but there are, again, I gave examples before when I mentioned, you know, Autada, the, the mountains as pegs, there wasn't a theory that the mountains were as pegs back then, but we know now that the mountains do affect the earth in terms of uh, tectonic plates, in terms of earthquakes, in terms of stability. So there are things that were discovered later that the Quran references, uh, but to say that this is about the theory, it's not always easy to make that uh, connection. But but again, it's not just these three examples here. There are many others. I just, I did not want to give this too much attention so that it's not relied upon as uh, a primary facet of Ijaz. It is something that is important. It is something that is true. And there are explicit examples like the ones that are mentioned here. But we do not need uh, too many of these to uh, to prove that the Quran is the book of guidance. This is like the atheist who asked me once, like, why does the Quran not talk about uh, E equals MC squared or dinosaurs? I so that is that the only metric you have for truth? Like it has to mention a theory. That's not what the Quran is for. And who are you to, to determine uh, with what wisdom do you have to determine what the Quran should contain as a book of guidance for all of humanity? It's a very arrogant, you know, uh, thing to say. As for the question of like, you know, theories and math and history, the Quran is not going to contain everything about every single subject. So therefore, Allah subhanahu wa taala, in His wisdom, is going to give us what we need, and it is and it is sufficient. There are other things we may discover and and study and and find out about the natural world that are beneficial for us and should bring us closer to God in terms of the natural world. But they don't need to be uh, in the Quran for them to be uh, for the Quran to be true. Allah subhanahu wa taala, alam. Uh, this is the topic of scientific miracles. I know it's something people really love and stick to. It's just something I want to keep brief because I don't want people to rely upon it uh, too much. I'll be very uh, brief in Shalat Allah with, with, I'll try to be brief with the, the last few uh, facets of the Ajaz. Um, a lot of people, when I ask them what they believe in, will work backwards uh, logically in terms of who God is. Like I'll give you an example, a person that I asked, 
like, what do you believe about God or life or purpose or religions? Uh, it was an older lady. She said, well, I believe that uh, there is a God and he's all loving. Therefore, you know, I incline towards like the religions like Christianity and others that say God is love. I say, yeah, but how do you know God is all loving and not, let's say, like also the all wise or the all powerful or uh, that he has speech, kalam Allah, that he reveals to us? Like, how do you determine that? So, well, I, I feel like God should be, and I'm like, oh, how do you know God should be? So sometimes people start by assumptions, uh, assumptions that they have about who God is, and the assumptions may be completely wrong, and then they will look for religion to justify it. They'll look for an evidence to justify it, rather than looking for the evidence of who God is, and there's the fitwa here that, that recognizes there's a creator, without uh, having too many uh, too much knowledge about details, so the fitwa here being separate from uh, Islam, it's not synonymous. You recognize through the Quran who God is. Allah tells us who he is, and that's that's out of his mercy. So this facet of i'jaz tells us why we exist. What is our purpose? Who is our creator? There are so many people that struggle mentally and psychologically and emotionally, uh, feeling like they have a, a distance between them and God. In fact, there are many studies that have found when people go through hardships and their, their thought is God is angry with me or there is no God or this has no meaning and the suffering has no purpose, that they in fact will struggle more mentally and emotionally. Whereas those who believe in God and believe that there is a purpose and this is God's wisdom and that I will be rewarded for my patience tended to be happier and stronger and more likely to uh, cope with it. These are foundational existential questions humans have always asked. Why do we exist? What is our purpose? Who created us? Who created this universe? Who is God? The Quran doesn't need to go into your third grade math and tell you or physics or dinosaurs or something. No, the Quran is answering the question of who you are and who's your God, who is your creator. And so it's very straightforward. It's very easy. A child can understand the concept of God. And it is from the fitrah. Children do naturally understand that there is a creator and they call upon a creator. And people who are even atheists and agnostics at times have told us that they called upon God when they went through severe hardships. They said, let me try this out. Let me do this. Let me let me ask God for help. Maybe I will get some help. And I, I've spoken to people personally who, who have expressed things like that. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ one of the shortest chapters of the Quran, uh, say indeed he is Allah, uh, the one. It's a very straightforward, short surah, four ayat, four verses. Allah Samad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is uh, uh, unaffected by us. He is uh, constant for us. He is uh, self-sufficient, al Samad. You can always rely upon him. You can always turn to him, uh, unaffected by your circumstances. al Samud is firmness. Uh, whereas we are constantly going through things, changing, experiencing hardship and ease, and we turn to God and ask him for help. Al-Samad is the one who also uh, sustained and maintained this universe for you. Al-Khaliq, he's uh, perpetually creating. And we look at the universe and we see in physics and we see in other uh, areas of science how fine-tuned the universe is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to observe the world around us, to observe and to reflect on the heavens and the earth. وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبْصِرُونَ And reflect within as well. Do you not see? And in the previous verse we were talking about, I believe is the verse about uh, water. Uh, do they not believe? It's interesting that the end of that verse is, do they not then believe um, at a time which people did not know that every living being was created from water? It's something we would discover later on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us who we are and our purpose as well. And that this universe was not created for play. We have a purpose. What's beautiful about this as well is it liberates human beings from the meaningless pursuits of materialistic things or self-worship, the worship of desires that many people struggle with. So th this has an impact on human beings. It liberates human beings. Uh, it fulfills them emotionally, psychologically. It takes care of all these psychological needs that we have. And your meaning and your value as a human being cannot be taken away when you lose something worldly. Like that man who lost his job. He said, I've been here 25 years. I identify with this job. This job is my life, my calling. Now I feel like my life has no purpose or meaning. Well, no, Allah gave you a purpose to worship him, to know him. And nobody can take the, take away that purpose. It's your choice to submit to him. So th these verses of the Quran about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the names and attributes of God, your purpose in life, your meaning in life. In fact, they liberate you from being attached to your desires or something of this world um, that is temporary. Everything of this life is temporary. So you're liberated in, in, in with regards to this in that you know why you are here, what you should be doing, and that's always your choice until your last breath. This is one of uh, many examples of uh, facets of Ijaz that requires maybe a little more uh, detail. I'll go through the last uh, two or three very quickly, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, morality. 
timeless morality. Now, we don't always say it's absolute because in fiqh, in jurisprudence, there are things that change, but it is objective morality. And I frequently talk to people, and this is like 80% of the arguments that come up, and I'm throwing out a random number here, 80% of the arguments that come up sometimes are just um, moral objections that you can eliminate very quickly by asking like the young MIT student who I, I was talking to on Zoom and he wanted to talk. So I thought, you know, okay, maybe this, this is going to lead to some progress. And I asked him what he believes. And he said, I have objections to Islam. I said, okay, on what basis? He said, what does that mean? I said, on what basis do you have an objection to Islam? He said, I don't understand your question. I said, how can you object to something morally in Islam unless you have something else you're relying on? So how do you know something is wrong, immoral, uh, in terms of Islamic teachings, in terms of Islamic law? He says, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out. I said, well, you can't object to it. You can't claim it's crooked unless you know what a straight line is. You can't claim something is immoral unless you know what morality is. And it's 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 like you assume that you he had left Islam and came back to it later. It's like you're assuming that you you did not have a foundation as a Muslim from something else, let's say from a secular impact, secularization of the mind, from liberalism, from another religion that caused you to look at Islam in a certain way, distorted your worldview. And then you you had a problem with Islam, objected to it, left Islam, and now you are claiming you have something better? Is there another set of uh, moral values that you have? And he said, I'm looking for something that will give me morality, but I, I just have these issues that nobody has answered for me. We went through the issues, and it's like playing whack-a-mole. You answer one issue, and these are second issues. There's a second, a third, and fourth. And this is why I advise Muslims not to waste a lot of time with, uh, not a lot of time, with moral debates, especially students of knowledge and imams and others, uh, we can answer questions that come up like why hijab, why zakah, why you know this law, why that punishment. We can answer these. They're not difficult. However, there's a problem with the methodology here. Where are you getting your moral values from? That's what it is at the end of the day. We believe in objective morality, that it's revealed to us, it is timeless, and it in fact liberates us from uh, not just our own uh, conflicts as human beings, because any two of us can disagree about subjective things, uh, but also for all of humanity to have boundaries, principles, and maxims. You have usul, you have qawaid, uh, in terms of fiqh, in terms of jurisprudence, you have maqasid, the purposes of revelation, to preserve life, to preserve uh, beliefs, uh, in terms of religion, to preserve uh, progeny, intellect, and wealth, so people's uh, intellect, people's um, you know uh, belongings. So all of this, we are liberated as human beings from the uh, khilaf and istilaf that we can have over anything, the disagreements through objective morality. And so I'm not going to get into, I'm not really focusing on here like an argument for the existence of God for morality, but rather that the Quran contains laws and morals and guidance for every society. And some of these are easier to observe in terms of their benefits and others require more iman and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of not knowing the wisdoms, not knowing the illa for something, the, the cause of a ruling. And an obvious example, something that all human beings can look at and say we cannot deny this, is the prohibition of uh, intoxicants. So alcohol. I cannot count the number of times. I read uh, like a set of studies uh, almost every morning, like news studies and, and things like that. I cannot count the number of times another study has come out telling us that no amount of alcohol is safe for you. Alcohol is destructive for you. Alcohol is linked to a lot of diseases. Alcohol is destructive for your psychological and mental health. Uh, alcohol destroys families. Alcohol has caused, or sorry, been related to and linked to a lot of crimes car accidents. We had a family of four Muslims driving back up to Michigan a few years back, and they were driving on the night of, uh, in the U.S., the New Year's Eve, uh, or sorry, New Year's, and a drunk driver went across the highway and ran into the, the car because he was drunk uh, and killed the entire family of four, and he survived. Alcohol is linked to so many problems in this world, so many diseases. Nobody can deny, even from a medical perspective, how damaging it is, how harmful it is. Um, but they're not all, not every prohibition or ruling is that obvious, but many of them can be uh, proven through different discussions, uh, research, uh, you know, data surveys, things like that. They can be explored. Generally, though, whether we understand the wisdom of a ruling or not, we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are liberated from uh, our own relative uh, perspectives. Masam, were you going to add anything, Akhi? Uh, no, no, no. I was, uh, you know, uh, I actually came across a study recently that also talked about how uh, alcohol-related crimes uh, are vastly exceed drug-related crimes. But the author pretty much says that it's too late to to criminalize alcohol because it becomes so socially acceptable uh, in, in such a widespread manner. But you know, drugs not yet. So we got to make sure that we prohibit drugs. But it's too late for alcohol. So you know, as we were talking, I was just remembering that. Actually, got, yeah. I was just looking at the source. Uh, yeah, it was. It's actually in the uh, in an article entitled "Drugs and Crime" in the Oxford Handbook of Crime and Criminal Justice, page three. So, Subhanallah. I actually uploaded it on my blog 
very recently, just a, a month ago. So yeah, as you were talking, I was just uh, recalling that. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. I've had so many conversations with uh, like non-Muslims who told me that they stopped drinking alcohol uh, for many reasons. There are a lot of non-Muslims who, are, who no longer drink alcohol. So a lot of, you know, of a lot of, for a lot of reasons, they've seen its harms in their lives. And one of them said to me, and this is why I'm sharing this because it was uh, firsthand. He said, I used to, when I first stopped drinking alcohol, I used to see my friends on uh, these nights in which they would drink change from like, you know, conscious, sane friends to like, he's like, they became like animals. They drank a lot. They, it's like, I was talking to different people. He's like, it was so weird to see them in that state and to wonder, was I like this all these years? Mm. It's a, it's a very weird thing to take away one of the greatest gifts that God gave you, like, the, you know, a metacognition and consciousness and awareness. Uh, so he, he said, I, I just find it so repulsive now. And he, he kind of like changed his uh, group of friends and his uh, socializing. But we've had many people look at the uh, benefits and the blessings of different rulings in Islam. And for them, it was a motivation that, you know, that this is uh, clearly something good for us. It liberates us as a collective. And it doesn't focus on individualistic desires or self-worship. Uh, and in fact, the Quran frees us from self-worship, which is one of the biggest struggles that, that the people have. Uh, but it is, this is one of many. Um, somebody asked me, another facet of the Ajaz is the ease by which the Quran is memorized. And I think earlier, Khiba Sam, you were going through the list and you're talking about examples of how people might not find some impactful or resonate with them. This is one that a lot of people did not find impactful. I don't really use this in Dawah. Uh, and I, I think we have incentives as Muslims to memorize the Quran. Uh, many other religions don't have incentives. We have a lot of ahadith and ayat uh, about the Quran, relationship with the Quran. Iqra'u al-Quran fa'innahu ya'ti yawm al-qiyamati shafi'a li ashabi. Read the Quran often for it will come to its companion as an intercessor on the Day of Judgment, Sahih Muslim. You have the hadith uh, about the rising of ranks for the people of Quran on the Day of Judgment. Iqra' wartaqi wartil and recite as you used to recite in the dunya. So people have incentives to memorize the Quran. However, one of the areas that is you know remarkable to, to reflect on is how many people have memorized the Qur'an and how easy it is, and the majority perhaps are non-Arabs, majority of Muslims are non-Arabs, by the way, uh, how easy it is to memorize the Qur'an even if someone doesn't know the Arabic language. And so you find millions of Muslims have memorized the Qur'an, millions of Muslims. And in almost every major city in the world, you will find groups of Hufad, people who have memorized the Qur'an from cover to cover and can recite it all perfectly and with no mistakes whatsoever. It's not weird to us as Muslims because we see it all the time, but sometimes non-Muslims, uh, are shocked by it. They're baffled. You memorized? In fact, not just the entire Quran. I had somebody tell me once, um, they, they were reading through a translation I had given them, uh, one of my teachers um, in high school. And uh, she was going through it. She's like, wow, this first chapter is so long. Um, y do you guys ever read or memorize, you know, like parts and, 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 and bits of this chapter? I said, no. I mean, some of us have memorized all of it. So you memorized all of this? I said, well, yeah, I, I went through a Quran. So, so I, I, alhamdulillah, I memorized the Quran. She's like, I don't believe you. I said, yeah, a lot of Muslims have. It's not, it's not a shocking thing. So you guys memorized your entire text. I said, yeah. It's like, well, we don't have that in, in Christianity. We don't memorize the entire uh, New Testament. We don't memorize like even entire gospel. It's not a common thing. You might find a few people here and there. Um, so for some people, it is a mesmerizing thing, how easy it is for Muslims to memorize the Quran, the ease by which the Quran is memorized. It's a reminder for us as well that there is a barakah and a blessing given to us to memorize the Qur'an, unlike many other things that are not easy to memorize, Wallah ta'ala alam. But it's not one of the things I, I usually put at the forefront of discussions on Ijaz al-Qur'an, because uh, again, we have the, the incentives to memorize and many other things that are hard to quantify, Wallah ta'ala alam. Another of the uh, aspects of Ijaz that we already covered is the perfection of the Qur'an, lack of errors and contradictions, the impact of the Qur'an. One time in, a, in, a, in, a, in an audience of maybe 250, I asked everyone, um, how many of you, uh, basically, what, what's your main reason for believing the Qur'an? What moves you the most about this topic of Ijaz? And the overwhelming majority gave examples that are actually personal impacts of the Qur'an on their hearts. And this is where the fitrah comes in, the natural disposition, the Qur'an's impact on your heart. And when you read it and you try to study it, and even when you read the translation and the tafsir loosely, and attempt at the meaning here, you'll find that it has an impact on who you are, uh, you, you don't really get bored of listening to the Qur'an as a way of life. Like you can listen today to the Qur'an for an hour, like a recording to tomorrow, the same same surah, same reciter. You don't get bored of it. You just listen over and over. And in fact, the, the beautiful recitations move you even more to listen. The, the perfect tajweed as, as well uh, motivates you to keep listening. So it, it's something that has a, an eloquence and a marvel to it. Even the poets at that time, the poets who were not Muslim at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, they would be moved by the 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 
words of the Quran, and they would say, I'm like one of them would say, Al-Walid al I am the most proficient amongst you to the other uh, elites of Quraysh in terms of poetry. And he said, even the poetry of the jinn, he said, I'm the most proficient. And then he testified that basically there is nothing like this. There is nothing like the Quran. And I, I'm summarizing a very long thing that I have mentioned in the uh, article. Long story short, there's no need to appeal to um, authority here or like the testimony of a non-Muslim, but you sometimes look at people who are proficient and you say, if they are moved by it, if they are affected by it, even though some of them have arrogance and will hold on to their disbelief or, or their power or their political uh, agendas, they they have testified that this is something they cannot explain away. And, you know, somebody asked me the other day, uh, a Christian, he said, well, uh, what about the explanation that some, sorry, not a Christian, atheist. What about the, the explanation that uh, people have come up with that maybe it's magic? I said, magic, that's such a weird one because if you claim the Quran is is magic, uh, first of all, it, it's not, and, and the Quran contradicts it and will refute it and tell you to be protected against it and all of that. It's giving you an opposite message of who God is and who the angels are and the devils and all that. May Allah protect us all. But more importantly is this, that means you believe in something supernatural. If you're claiming it's magic, that means it was so mesmerizing, it was otherworldly. You couldn't claim that it was man-made, so you had to explain it was something supernatural. In other words, you're one step closer to to figure out where yeah. the Quran is actually uh, coming from. Allah I'm Allah. Not, not to also mention uh, that other magicians would have been able to see through him and expose him, right? Yes. And uh, so that's another thing. But uh, I did have a question uh, since you brought up the whole magician. I mean, go, if we scroll back maybe a few slides back to your, when it comes to prophecies, how how would you counter the fortune teller argument, right? Because, uh, you know, the, the, does not even... Uh, Islam teach that sometimes the devils could um, acquire access to uh, knowledge, you know, knowledge of the future. Uh, aren't there fortune tellers that sometimes, you know, get it right? Um, so how how would we how do we what would be the primary difference between a, tr a true prophet of God and and a fortune teller, for example? When it is specific, obviously there's many differences, but if we were to talk about specifically in the context of foreknowledge and prophecy. Excellent. Jazakallah uh, khairan. That's a great point. Uh, and, and this does come up every now and then. Uh, sometimes it comes up from Christians uh, because they believe in some similar things to us as Muslims. So the first is that the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, you, you look at the language and you look at what's being said about magic, about devils. And uh, obviously, uh, there's a reference to evil, that it's an evil thing, and that there's a lot of good as well. Uh, the, the human beings, the believers who do righteousness, the angels that do exactly as Allah commanded. So the first thing to keep in mind is that the Quran already told us that there is such thing as magic and told us what it's like and told us that we are protected against and told us what you need to destroy, including the Quran, which destroys magic. And as well, uh, through the Prophet Sallallahu the example of the devils who listen and they climb up on one another and they listen and they take the qadr, the decree that is being shared about an individual in the heavens in a way we cannot see as human beings. Uh, but they take the decree of a human being and they pass down that news, that, that, that information to somebody who works with the devils, who sold their souls to the devils, may Allah protect us all. And these people will then share one truth to an individual, to a human being with uh, what the Prophet ﷺ described and what is known as many lies. When that person sees that truth, uh, manifest, they will assume everything else is true and that the magician knows the future. So this information is not from the magician, it's from a uh, a devil, and this magician has worked with the devils. But more importantly than this, um, the, the, the magician is, is doing something evil, and this is in fact one of the nullifiers uh, of Iman uh, for people to to uh, be working with devils or to even uh, go to fortune tellers is prohibited in Islam. It is a very severe thing, it's not a, a minor thing. And uh, in addition to this, the 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 shart, the condition of a mu'jiza is that it's coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's linked to the one who's claiming prophethood. Uh, the magicians are not. And uh, what they're coming with is a lot of lies, a lot of evil working with the devils rather than uh, calling people to worship God, calling people to piety, calling people to good things. Um, and the prophet does not claim to have knowledge of the future, rather the knowledge is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The magicians are claiming to have knowledge of the future and want people to come to them. And oftentimes this is a, a big distinction uh, between the two. The magicians can lie a lot. The prophets do not lie. Um, so a miracle emerges here, again, is one in which it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly or indirectly. It is linked to uh, the one who is claiming prophethood and it is uh, inimitable. People cannot do it themselves. Um, and this is something we, we, we see in many of the prophecies that came to the Prophet ﷺ, many of the for, for, uh, different types of foreknowledge about what will happen, uh, let's say, 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, or at the end of times, uh, or things that have happened only in recent uh, centuries, Wallah ta'ala, Adam. It would also be odd, it would also be odd for Satan 
to assist someone who is preaching against him and is preaching to others to, 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 to worship God, right? So, you know, why would Satan assist someone like Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, knowing full well that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is, is uh, you know, is, is not, uh, you know, uh, exactly his friend, so, so to speak. And I think, you know, a theological, uh, you, you mentioned the point earlier that, you know, uh, you know you're, with that uh, atheist individual, when he raised the prospect of this as a possibility, and you, you know, uh, pointed out, rightfully so, that he's already conceded that he's, uh, you know, not a naturalist, and he's recognized that there could be a supernatural realm. I think once we reach to that point, then we need to ask a theological question. You know, if there is a supernatural realm, then we would be more prone to accepting that God exists. And if God does exist, is he really going to allow, um, uh, you know, frauds to perform supernatural uh, acts and not give us a way or a method to, 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 to identify whether they are frauds or not? Right. So it's like the Prophet said, you know, these fortune tellers might tell the truth one out of a hundred times. But you know, you should keep your keep an eye for, for, for the false things that they say as well. So even if you have someone that because again, it you know, the it, epistemically speaking, if we want to know how to distinguish between a false prophet and uh, and a fraud, we would also have to make sure that our eyes are wide open for, for any errors or mistakes that that that, 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 that these people commit and so it's not Absolutely. enough it's not enough to just hone in on a apparent minor similarity but to but to assess everything holistically so uh, i wanted to come back around to the topic of prophet muhammad as i kind of wrap up here because this really is going to be uh, directly uh, link to the entire discussion for anyone who explores the Al-Jaz quran who is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He had no control over the revelation. He was known as As-Sadiq Al-Amin. This is his nickname because of who he was. In fact, some of the, the people of Quraysh kept their money with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even after uh, he started to, to uh, receive uh, revelation and, and prophethood. Uh, in one, one example of this, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, told those who are asking questions, I'll tell you tomorrow about what you asked me, but he did not say, inshallah, if Allah wills. So they left, 15 days had passed without any revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about what they had asked. And Jibreel Islam did not come to the Prophet sallallahu during those 15 days. So the people of Mecca started to wonder and doubt him. That They started saying, Muhammad promised to tell us the next day. Now 15 days have gone by, he did not tell us anything at all. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa you can imagine, maybe he felt really sad because he's waiting for revelation, waiting for the answer. And the people of Mecca are waiting for him. Maybe this will cause some of them to, to start to doubt him or mock him. Jibreel then finally came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with, the, uh, with Surah Al-Kaf, the Surah about the companions of Al-Kaf. And it also contained a rebuke for uh, feeling sad about the idol worshippers. And the Surah also informed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about the matters that they had asked about, the questions that they had, the young men and the traveler, as well as the verse about the soul in uh, another place. And in addition, as was reported by uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, uh, do not say indeed I will do that tomorrow except what without adding if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will add insha'Allah illa in insha'Allah and remember your Lord when you forget to say it and then say perhaps my Lord will guide me to what is nearer uh, than this to right conduct so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa this is one of many examples he did not have control over the revelation. In fact, he was grieved, saddened, lack of revelation uh, when people uh, were questioning him. And the same happened before Surah Al-Duha was revealed and it came down as consolation. Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. He's constantly being consoled and comforted through the Quran as well. And uh, of course, this is a reminder, he would not want to be in a position that is difficult in front of his opponents. He is a human being at the end of the day, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And of course, for someone to assume in a ridiculous fashion that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, came up with this on his own, and he wouldn't put himself in such a position, a, a dilemma, if it was something that is avoidable. And the second thing is that the Prophet ﷺ had a lot of emotional experiences in his life. When you study his life, the seerah, while you're studying the Qur'an, you find that the Qur'an is not like it's suddenly changing the emotions and the passion is changing because of what the Prophet is going through, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
he was uh, he didn't meet his father. His mother died when he was six. He was uh, t- taken care of by his grandfather, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then later on by his uncle, protected and protected and supported by Khadija radiallahu anha. And they both died in the same year. Look at how many losses he went through. Given revelation, his own people mocking him, doubting him, questioning him, kicking him out of his hometown, boycotting him and his followers, killing uh, Sumayya and Yasir, the family of Yasir, in front of him, and he could not stop them. All he could do is give them the glad tidings of Jannah. Be patient. Be patient, uh, for Jannah is your home. Prophet ﷺ went through a lot of emotional turmoil, a lot of turmoil. And yet you'll find the, the voice of the Qur'an is consistent. And I use the word voice loosely here. The voice is consistent throughout. And the Prophet ﷺ was harassed after Ta'if as well. And he was bleeding and made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is this human experience that you don't find fully uh, manifested in the voice of the Quran. It's very distinct from the voice of the Prophet Wasallam. If you know Arabic and you've read many of the narrations in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim, and you read the Quran frequently, you know that the, the language is also very different. Uh, these are two very different voices. And I don't need to get into uh, stylometric analysis to kind of demonstrate this, but there are they are different voices for those who are familiar with them. And the last point I'll mention here, Sorry, the second last point. The Quran rebukes Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam many times. There are many leaders and many uh, people of power who would never want to be in an embarrassing position. Would never want their image or reputation tarnished in any way whatsoever. And this is common amongst many people in the world, many human beings. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was rebuked by Allah subhanahu wa taala for many different reasons. Abasa wa Tawalla is one of the the most famous examples when the Prophet. Uh, frowned and turned away and the, the blind man had come to him and this indicated and this was referring to the Prophet Sallallahu talking to the elites of Quraysh trying to give da'wah to people he saw as more maybe influential or important to give da'wah to and the blind man came to ask him about Islam he was a Sahabi a famous Sahabi the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi turned away from him because he was busy with delivering the message of Islam to the elite of Quraysh he had a good intention I want to deliver the message uh, hoping that some of their leaders would accept Islam because maybe then others would uh, follow but he was admonished for that because that blind man also should be considered in terms of uh, his needs and his questions about Islam. Do not basically turn him away. But here's a more powerful uh, threat in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threatened Prophet Muhammad sallallahu with a punishment if he did not convey the Quran or if he ever tampered with its verses. And the author of the Quran made it clear, the voice of the Quran, that nobody would be able to stop uh, him if he were to uh, basically do such a thing. And if he, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had made up uh, about us, about Allah, any false speech, we would have seized him by the right hand and then would have cut his aorta. And there's no one of you who could prevent us from that. And indeed, the Quran is a reminder. Indeed, for those who are God conscious, the Quran is a reminder. It will bring you closer to God. And we know amongst you there are uh, deniers of the truth. Uh, this will be a cause of regret for the disbelievers. Uh, indeed, it is the truth of certainty. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us by rebuking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, by the way, don't misunderstand. This doesn't mean the Prophet would ever do such a thing. He would never. That's why he was chosen as the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa But it would be very weird to imagine if the Quran was authored by a human being, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that he's threatening in a very severe way, criticizing harshly, admonishing himself, um, even about grief as well. Uh, when he was sad that people would not become Muslim, he was constantly comforted by Allah and reminded by Allah, don't grieve over what they say about you. Don't grieve over this and that. O Prophet, are you going to worry yourself to death if they do not become Muslim or believe in this message? In other words, the Prophet is being consoled and comforted in the Quran. This is a very distinct voice that is talking to the Prophet yaqulun. We know very well what they say grieves you, O Prophet. But they're not questioning you or your honesty or your message. However, it is Allah's signs, Allah's revelation that the wrongdoers are denying. All of these and much more are examples of the Prophet ﷺ being rebuked in the Quran, being reminded this does not take away anything from his character, anything from his uh, piety, anything from uh, the Prophet ﷺ's integrity. Uh, rather, he's very passionate about the truth. He's, uh, he's a human being. He's very merciful. He wants all people to accept the truth from God. And he knows he'll have to testify against humanity on the day of judgment. Uh, and those who heard him, 
They witnessed his life. They saw what he went through. They knew that he never sought any power, any glory, any wealth, anything of this life. He rejected all of that. And this is, is one of many examples of the facets of the Ajaz with regards to the individual who was chosen for this. And then finally, removing uh, all discussions on human authorship comes through the Ajaz of, of many other categories. The Quran, in terms of its miraculous nature, in terms of its inimitable qualities, uh, it, it demonstrates very clearly that there's no discussion that we need to have about human beings, about authorship, about all that. Why? We can have that conversation as we kind of did, but at the end of the day, the, the Quran in its miraculous facets, its literary inimitability, the undiscovered knowledge of the natural world, the knowledge of the future that has been proven historically as well, the spread of Islam, the conquest of Mecca, the, the Nasr at the Battle of Badr, the Roman Empire rebounding, the death of Abu Lahab, the knowledge of the past that the Prophet ﷺ did not have access to, the, the Jews and others had access to, they would come and test him and question him. He had information that sometimes they did not have. And also the word precision, the correct usage of certain terms in the Quran you don't find in the Bible, you don't find in the Old Testament or New Testament. Testament today as well, or you find mistakes in them. Uh, the Quran's the laws, the universal maxims, you find the impact of the Quran, hearts and minds and souls. All of this uh, is a standalone argument, a very collective, a standalone argument against any claim of human art, uh, authorship. And at the end of the day, in order to fully appreciate the arguments for Ijaz al Quran, that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, some people might deny one claim here and there or struggle with accepting or realizing it. But a justified, rational, sincere belief does not necessitate that a seeker of truth believes in the Qur'an only after all the facets of the Qur'an's ajaz are examined, but rather any number of proofs, any one of them would suffice. And the rational implications are many, because we are living in a times in which in the post-truth, post-modern world, people are, are looking at everything as uh, relative and subjective. But the reality is with, with regards to the domain of belief in God and with regards to uh, religion, uh, there is clear-cut evidence that the Qur'an is not uh, probably, the Qur'an is definitely from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is uh, guidance, it is a message for all who hear it, it is a message for all of those who are listening now, uh, that you will be held accountable for it. So explore it further, study it, follow it, uh, and submit to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you, because at the end of the day, this message is for you and you were created for the test of this life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and guide others through us. Allahumma ameen. 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 Uh, Barakallahu fikum, Shaykh, for that you know, very beneficial and iman boosting uh, presentation. I mean, of course, guidance is from uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Uh, yet we still thank him for making the correct path of salvation accessible and amenable to human reason through his signs for those who uh, genuinely seek the truth. Um, before we close, uh, I wanted to ask whether you have any general da'wah advice that you like to give Muslims, you know, should they just go out there and start, you know, presenting all this evidence to any non-Muslim that they speak right away? Or, or, or do you have any words of advice about, you know, how we go about this? Bismillah. Uh, my nasiha, my advice is be sincere, be really, really sincere, not just in terms of your intention for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because sometimes you might be sincere, in giving da'wah, but you might be doing the wrong thing. So it backfires. Be sincere in terms of your intention for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a condition of uh, acceptance and, and success. May Allah grant us sincerity. But also, my nasiha has be sincere in wanting good for people, in wanting others to be guided in the most effective manner for them, the most uh, wise and strategic manner for that individual. That if you want someone to accept the truth, you're not just going to give everyone the same exact uh, copy paste, you know, statement or uh, take, you know, like a blogging theology lecture and just share it with everybody in the same exact way. Consider your approach must be wise, as is uh, the command of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Call people to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good admonishment, good speech. So when you're discussing the truth with others, uh, recognize that part of your sincerity towards other people is knowing who it is, your target audience, knowing who the individual is, and knowing that dawah is a very extensive topic. It has many methodologies, many different needs. And one of the most common reasons 
people come to our Islamic centers, in fact, is not intellectual at all. The first impression that they had from Muslims uh, was uh, one of good character, good manners. It's one of the most powerful things, one of the most uh, effective forms of da'wah that uh, somebody ran into a good Muslim. There are people who deal with Muslims in business and trade. And they said, these Muslims are so honest. Don't cheat, don't lie, don't mess around. This was enough da'wah for them. There are Muslims who work in the corporate spaces who don't know much about Islam. They cannot give da'wah and talk about Ijaz al-Quran or anything like this, but they have some of the best character and ihsan and, and principles. And they pray on time. People look and say, these are principles people of integrity and people love that and they, they gravitate towards that and so your da'wah will vary from place to place and time to time in terms of where you are and what you're doing and what Allah gave you in your life uh, but everyone has a role to play it is the minimum requirement for every Muslim to have good character but not every Muslim needs to know all the details of Ijaz al-Quran Dalat Nubuwa we need to know enough to have a foundation to, to give da'wah to others to teach our children in terms of tarbiyah in terms of upbringing as for da'wah methodology my advice is uh, learn and learn and learn and learn uh, what the truth is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you'll find, uh, and, and when I say for the sake of Allah, I mean for your own sake, like for your own salvation. Don't do it just because you want to go share with others. No, you seek knowledge in order to get closer to Allah and you will find its effects on your character, on your heart, and then later on on how you uh, advise other people, how you give da'wah to others. You, you then have a responsibility to always be reminding, advising through your character and in the wisest manner possible, your family, your loved ones, your relatives. Some people are out there giving da'wah and they completely neglect their families or their children, their sons and their daughters in a day and age like this in which they are in need of uh, upbringing of da'wah from their mothers and their fathers, and then to your community and then to your friends and then online as well. And talking about Ijaz uh, al-Quran is not suitable in every situation or not necessary as a first conversation. Somebody asked me just yesterday in one of uh, our tarbiyah programs uh, at Al-Maghrib, he asked me, what's your favorite Ijaz al-Quran argument that you'll use with almost everyone, like your go-to? I said, I don't have a go-to. I, I like to know who the person is. I like to know what they already think, how they think. Sometimes you have to deconstruct things in order to construct new things. So you really need to, to understand who the person is uh, before you get into a conversation about something uh, deep. And also you need to make sure you know the material well, uh, so you're not causing any harm to the individual, inshallah ta'ala. And when you talk about Ijaz al-Quran or any other similar topic, it's not necessary that you need to know every single thing about it to share it, share resources. And don't be embarrassed or shy. And this is where sincerity kicks in to ever say, I don't know. And I, I will look for you. I will look for an answer for you. I will recommend something for you. I'll ask a scholar for you or a student of knowledge, but I personally don't know. It's more embarrassing to give the wrong answer and cause harm to that person's afterlife or your own. Um, and don't look, the last advice that I'll give, do not look for and strive for the loud or showy or entertaining or rude or aggressive uh, da'wah as your main standard. Look to the Prophet wasallam. The Prophet is the ultimate role model, uswatun hasana. And the way he called people to Islam in different stories in different contexts is is uh, is necessary for us to study so that we can take him as a role model and so that we are successful as human beings, as believers, and as people who want good for all of humanity in terms of guidance to the truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us sincerity and accept from all of us. Allahumma ameen.